Live Bellator Fighting Championships along with FullTiltPoker.net and Everlast. What do you fight for? Tonight at Bellator 32 now present five five-minute rounds for the first ever Bellator World Bantamweight Championship. And now introducing first fighting out of the red corner. He wears the red at five foot nine, weighing in at 134 and one quarter pounds. The submission fighter and kickboxer brings a professional record with 15 victories, eight by way of submission against four defeats. Representing Apex MMA and fighting out of Tucson, Arizona, the first tournament finalist, Ed Wild West. And across the cage is adversary fighting out of the blue corner. He wears the blue trimmed in yellow at five foot four, weighing in the same at 134 and one quarter pounds. The standout wrestler as a professional brings 11 victories, five by way of submission against two defeats. Representing Philadelphia Fight Factory and fighting out of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, tournament finalist Zach Funsize Makovsky. And the referee for this contest, Jason Herzog. Fighters gone over the rules for the in the back. There are no final questions from you, Blue. No final questions from you, Red. Touch gloves, come out ready to fight. Tonight's Bellator Tournament Finals are under the unified rules of combat as they are for Bellator World Championships. They are scheduled for five five-minute rounds. Elbows to the head are allowed, both standing and on the ground, and there is no kicking or kneeing the head of a grounded opponent. The victor in this bout will win Bellator's inaugural bantamweight tournament and be crowned Bellator's first ever world champion at 135 pounds. At West in the red trunks, Zach Makovsky in the navy blue trunks, Jason Herzog is the referee. You see Ed West moving a lot. I think that's gonna be his key in this fight. He's got great movement and a fast head kick. Both fighters very confident that they would respectively win this bout, and both felt that there was a high likelihood this would go all five rounds. Both guys, I think, confident but cautious. They're aware of their abilities, also very aware of their opponent's abilities. Makovsky wrestled at the NCAA Division I level at Drexel University. Wes said, I am superior to Makovsky in all aspects of MMA, save for wrestling. I don't know, Makovsky's jiu-jitsu looks pretty good, too. Makovsky missing with that head kick. I don't think Makovsky's going to want to play this game very long against Ed West. I think he's going to try and corner him and get the takedown. West five inches taller than his opponent, Makovsky. West standing 5'9". West throwing a lot of kicks for someone who's taking on a, a superior wrestler. Single leg attempt. And that's just what West told us, Jimmy, that he would do in the fighter meeting not resist the takedown, but go to his back and then pull closed guard. Well, the problem is that it's easy to give away a lot of rounds pulling closed guard. As long as you're on the bottom and your opponent's doing anything at all, nine times out of ten, he wins that round. So the problem with not resisting the takedown is, A, it's easy for Makovsky to take you down. He's not expending a lot of energy. And number two, once they're on the ground, unless you're going for a lot of submissions, it's easy to give away rounds. Wes said that Makovsky has the best single leg takedown that he has ever seen in MMA. He has a great single leg. And he said he just simply on the single leg or the double leg was not going to fight it, burn energy, just accept the takedown and do this, close guard and work from the bottom. Now, Kazushi Sakuraba very successful with the single leg, but it's rare. Most guys like that safe double leg. Chest, in, you know, head in the center of the other guy's chest, but. Makovsky can take you down a bunch of different ways. Punch from the bottom by West. That surprised Makovsky. Big left hand by Makovsky, another. Not fully finding the mark, though, on those punches. Makovsky has good ground and pound. He has short limbs. He's stocky. He's powerful. Great stand-up. Roll back and then back to his feet. Somersault to the stand-up by Ed West. Yes, that's why they call him Wild West. Unorthodox, dynamic, and physical. Both these guys physical freaks. Makovsky trying to move forward. West said, I want to stick and move, stick and move. 
Now, the problem Ed West is going to have is that he's very accurate with the strikes, and he mixes, mixes it up very well. He hasn't shown us a ton of knockout power. I don't know if he has the, you know, really the power to knock Makovsky out unless he really comes in. West just missed with that head kick. Low kick by Makovsky. Push kick by Zach Makovsky. West actually smirked on that. Now that's the wrestler's kryptonite, is a guy that can throw hard enough to make him hesitate. And see, there is no hesitation with Zach Makovsky. And again, the single leg takedown by Makovsky, hardly resisted by West. Watch the back of the head fighter on top. Now West so flexible, trying to use that far leg to get underneath, and he gets it. Boom, back to guard. West is a fighter who talks all the time that he is very comfortable fighting off of his back. Uh, I was watching him train before his fight with Goldsby, and he has a dangerous guard, very tricky. Makovsky said his biggest fear in this fight was being held in West's closed guard. You see he's trying furiously to pass, trying to pass to the weak side. The side the guard is open, which is Makovsky's left side. That's the side he's trying to pass. Final minute of round number one. And most guys cannot get up that way, but Ed West able to pop back to his feet. Slight mouse under the left eye of Zach Makovsky. Step in with the left hand by Makovsky. Power shots from both guys are going to land more effectively because they have opposite stances. Simultaneous leg kicks. We are headed to round number two. Stop there. Stop. This for Bellator's World Bantamweight Championship. The winner of this fight will become the inaugural champion of Bellator at 135 pounds. Ed West is in the red trunk, Zach Makovsky in the navy blue trunks. West looking for the side kick the and the single leg takedown by Makovsky. And the problem with that side stance, that karate stance, is very hard to stop the takedown. Now, this is a position in his last couple fights where Makovsky was all over, guys, transitioning very well, and he's had trouble passing the guard of Ed West. So he takes him down, works a little ground and pound, but before he was so dynamic all over, guys, and Ed West, really difficult to deal with on the ground. You can see it. And the full guard held by Ed West. Jimmy, round number one, very difficult to score. Very difficult to score. I gave it 10-9 to Zach Makovsky based on that takedown and ground and pound. Ed West had a little more success on the feet, but I think Makovsky won that round based on his takedown. But it could have gone either way. Jimmy, thus far, who do you think has the edge in the stand-up? Ed West, for sure. I mean, he's, he's, Mikoski's done well. It hasn't been a blowout by any means, but Ed West has landed a little bit more effectively. We see West uh, more gun shy than he was against Goldsby and Vega because he's so concerned about that takedown. Mikoski moving forward tenaciously. Head that's, kick attempt by Mikoski. And that's when Mikoski's been successful is when he has Ed West cornered. It's his movement that is so dangerous, his ability to set up strikes. If you can corner him, if you can keep him in one, in one spot, Makovsky does have a lot of power in his hands. Two very different stances. West so much bounce in his step. Makovsky standing not like a traditional wrestler, but definitely more flat-footed. And always low. It's just at 135, you don't see a lot of knockouts. These guys just don't pack the kind of power that can knock somebody out. It's, it's rare to see a 135 that has real KO power. West trying to throw the head kick. Definitely blocked by Makovsky. Low kick by West getting through. Okay, it's Makovsky coming forward, West on his bicycle. West looking for those opportunities to counter. But he has to land cleanly because, you know, for, in terms of aggression and ring control, cage control, got to give the, the edge to Mikasi because he's moving forward. West just fainting, the spinning back kick. Single leg, West tries to jump out of it. Man, every time 
He gets a hand on a leg. He gets the takedown. Side control now held by Makovsky. This is something that West talked about. He really did not want to have Makovsky holding side position. Look at the flexibility of Ed West. Grabbing his leg, just trying to keep Makovsky locked down. But Makovsky can throw knees just like that from here. Needs to free up that left arm. It's a good position to hold, but he's not going to be able to, to get out of this position. Ed West, unless he lets go of that and starts moving his hips around. West definitely burns energy, doesn't he, Jimmy, holding that? Uh, he burns some energy, but it might be worth it if he can get a stand-up out of it. But there's only a minute left. Let's see what he can do. Finally letting that position go. Remember, this is scheduled for five five-minute rounds. The winner of this fight will become Bellator's first ever world bantamweight champion and, and win this inaugural bantamweight tournament. Ed West just trying to stay glued to Mikoski. Now moves. So slick from his back. Closing seconds of round number two. Jack Hammers with the left hand there. Good punches by Mikovsky. But for all the trickiness of his guard, it has been a defensive guard. He hasn't really gone for any submissions, hasn't come close to uh, catching Zach Mikovsky yet. West looking for the up kick. Good elbows from the bottom there by Looks West. Like he might be going for the Uma Plata here. That's exactly what he's going for, Jimmy. Now, you see Makovsky trying to control the right leg of Ed West so he can't step over and hook it. Only 14 seconds left, and he lets it go. Makovsky pulls out, cool as you like. Not yet to deep water, but I think we're headed there. Round number three upcoming. What's up there, guys? Down at the Power and Light District, Bellator 32. Round number three. This, the Bantamweight Tournament Final, the winner to become Bellator's first ever world champion at 135 pounds. Ed West in the red trunks, Zach Makovsky in the navy blue trunks. This is the ninth time in Ed West's career he has gone past two rounds, and the 11th time in Makovsky's career that he has gone past two rounds. Neither fighter has ever gone past three rounds. Jimmy, how do you have this scored thus far? That's another round for Zach Makovsky, 10-9. to 9. I thought he was a little more dominant in that round. But still, a 10-9 to 9 round for uh, Makovsky. Based on that wrestling and that control, we see it here. He gets a takedown. He's just so tenacious. Nice guard pass. That's, that's how you pass half guard. Guard pass in the side, controlled by Makovsky. Tight on the head and the arm. Beautiful job with the instep. That's how you're supposed to do it. Makovsky, not throwing elbows, just grinding in the elbow in the forearm. Well, I don't see him taking a lot of risks with his ground and pound. I don't see him letting it all hang out. He knows how dangerous Ed West can be. Again, the backward somersault to the feet by Ed West. Just so unorthodox. Ed West does a lot of things that other fighters just don't do. It's hard to train for a guy like that. Makovsky missing with the left hand. West fainting with the kick. West is not afraid to do that. I think because he's so quick, he'll faint with the kick, spin, give his back. No worries. No, he, he's not worried about it at all. And he's varying up his strikes so much that Makovsky has to worry about a lot of things coming. He doesn't want to charge in, get hit with some crazy spinning elbow off the kick. He's got to be respectful of his ability to hit everywhere. Not a lot of guys can do that. But not a lot of guys can do that either. From the that single is a leg, beautiful takedown. Waist cinch takedown. That was slick. Just think about that there. Shot the single leg, moved to the back, and the takedown. That is solid, solid world-class wrestling. Again, side control held by Makovsky. These are two phenomenal fighters. They're fast, they're unorthodox, they're skillful, they're flexible. It's a shame to see one of them lose, what you're going to see tonight. And two of the nicest guys we've ever dealt with in Bellator. That's oh. a bad cut that's in the outside of the right brow of Ed West, and that's really leaking blood. Well, that gives, the thing is, that gives Makovsky something to work on with that ground and pound. It gives him a target. He's been very cautious so far with his ground and pound. I think that's going to make him open up a little bit. Again, West holding closed guard. And the flip side is, will it give 
Ed West a sense of urgency. I haven't really gotten that sense so far that he believes he's losing and he believes he's down. But with that cut, he might turn it up. We'll have to see. Good no. right hand stepping in by Makovsky. You see what he does? He pounds to pass. He hits you with that right hand as you're recovering. He's trying to get around your guard. Let's go, fighters. Got to work. The good news on the cut for Ed West is that the position on the eyebrow is, again, backward somersault to the feet. The way the blood is flowing, it's away from the eye. We talk about this all the time, but for the uninitiated, blood into the eye, no permanent damage, but temporarily you're not going to have much vision, if any vision at all. Ed West was very candid. He said, that's my weakness, I guess, as a fighter, is that a lot of these guys have that Division I Olympic caliber wrestling. He goes, I just don't have it. Ed West looks like he's going for the guillotine. The arm is in. That's hard to finish. Let's see if he can do it. Arm in guillotine for West off the single leg shoot by Makovsky. And only has half guard. See Makovsky being very patient here. All patience, no panic from Makovsky. West, though, trying to crank. So you guys like Uriah Faber, Nate Diaz, they love this position, this almost bulldog guillotine from half guard, but he's not going to get it. Biggest ovation of the night here in Kansas City, Missouri, as Makovsky pops his head free. It's a knowledgeable MMA crowd that they applaud that. Yeah. Well, it's your hometown. You're a little biased. You know, it's Kansas City this. This is a great Kansas fight Kansas City town. that. Boxing, pro wrestling, now MMA. Pro wrestling does not count. We are headed officially to deep waters as we will go to round four. Stop there. The winner will be crowned Bellator's first ever world bantamweight champion. Ed West is in the red trunks. Zach Makovsky is in the navy blue trunks. First time that either fighter has gone past round three. And this is going to be a very interesting round for a few reasons. Will we see that sense of urgency from Ed West? On my card, he's down three rounds to none. He's not going to win a decision right here unless, you know, unless he really turns it up, gets a 10-8 round. He's, he, I think he has to finish. So it, it becomes a matter of is he going to turn it up and really look that finish? Does he believe he's behind? Jimmy, if one of the three State of Missouri judges had it on their official scorecard, say 29-28 West at this point, would you be shocked? No. No, first round, very, very close. Knee from side control again by Makovsky. See, Makovsky, I think, has, has solved the riddle of that guard. He's passed in the last round. He's passed so far in this round. He's getting way more successful, more aggressive with his jujitsu. He's the kind of guy where once he gets conf confident with the jujitsu, that's when he starts opening up with his strikes. Looking for that crucifix, trying to trap both arms. West again looking for the up kick. Makovsky just missing with the big looping right hand. Such great control by Makovsky. Ed West finding close guard once again. It's the back of the head, fighter on bottom. It's okay. Warning by referee Jason Herzog to West. Elbow to the back of the head. I think, I think Makovsky said it's okay. Those are illegal right there. Yeah. Towards the ear. A little dialogue going on about what's legal and what isn't. Like Lou said, both these guys have tremendous respect for one another. Very high with the guard. Let's go, guys. Got to keep working. I'm going to stand you. Call for action by referee Jason Herzog. Right there, guys. Up. There's the stand up. And that's Turn another around. thing. Refs get Turn less around. patient the as the fight goes on. They're going to see faster and faster stand ups. Can Ed West do something with it? Blood starting to trickle again out of the cut. Outside of the right brow of Ed West. Doesn't look fight stopping bad, however. Absolutely not. Totally correct, Jimmy. It's also a knot on the forehead on the left side of Ed West. Good lead hook by Makovsky. Oh, 
You just get that sense from Makovsky, though, that he's willing to play the game for a little bit. Once it gets hairy, he's going in for that takedown. Mouse under the left eye of Makovsky, which started the form in round one, looking a little bit worse here in round four. Man, great bounce in the step of Ed West, but it's not tra tra translating into the kind of power shots he needs to land to win this fight thus far. Good defense standing there by Ed West. Oh, beautiful inside trip. And Makovsky still with the takedown. But changing it up, he goes low. You defend low. He goes for the body lock inside trip. That's great wrestling. There you see the full closed low guard held by Ed West. Right hand to the body by Makovsky. The yep. flexibility of Ed West lets him get his feet in between him and Zach Makovsky. That's when he pushes off. West continues to look for those up kicks. Thigh kick there by Makovsky. Now no room to do the back somersault. He's up against the cage. Makovsky taking full advantage. Trying to pass. He likes that left side pass. Let's go, guys. Ed West so Keep flexible. Working. Able to push off from this half guard position. Right here is why this sport should be fought in a cage. We did two years in M1, which was in a ring, and it showed me that in a position like this, someone will shrimp out under the bottom rope and the stand up. And you get that awkward restart. It's just, cage is definitely part of the sport. We are headed to a rarity in MMA. Round number five at West versus Zach Makovsky. Round number five. Let's fight. The final round of the final bout in Bellator's inaugural bantamweight tournament. Again, the winner of this fight will be crowned Bellator's first ever world champion at 135 pounds. Ed West is in the red trunks. Zach Makovsky is in the navy blue trunks. Ooh, time. Time. Time called okay. by referee Jason Herzog. Right Unintentional right low here. kick by Take Zach Makovsky. Fighter, you're here? Yeah. West has a full five minutes. You got some time. You got five minutes. Take your time. You see here, not a dirty shot, but bang. Going for the thigh. Little bit high. I think Jason Herzog is an outstanding referee in MMA. Okay. Certainly one of the best, and that was great refereeing. Was so take yeah. your time, you Stay have careful. five minutes. Too many referees do no, not no remind no, fighters of the no. rule. And also, fighters don't want to take their time nine times out of ten. You don't want to look like it hurt. Okay. You don't want to milk the time. You just want to get back you in You got there. time. Make sure you're good, man. Final round. How much time? I think that's a sign of a great referee, talking to the fighters, communicating. Too many referees in this sport and in boxing, always trying to speed fighters up. How much time is... In the rules, and we're under the unified rules of combat, you get five minutes. Five minutes. Okay. Yeah, how much time does he have left? Yeah? You Referee ready? Jason Herzog, right. you ready, talking to our ready? timekeeper, Marsha Champion, and timing called. Well, Ed West has to turn it on in this round. If his, if his corner's being honest with him, if he has a, a realistic understanding of the way it's going now, he's behind in the scorecards. I have it as a blank, but... Either way, he's got to know he's behind. Has to let it all hang out and get the finish here. Right now, I have it 40-36 for Zach Funsize Makovsky. First round could have gone either way, but it's I don't know how you can see the last three rounds for anyone but uh, Makovsky. But I've been wrong before. About a lot of things, but uh, judging is certainly one of them. You've been wrong, Jimmy, or the judges have been wrong, and you've what been right. Whatever. It would be unethical for me to criticize the athletic commission of a state in which I am working. So I don't have anything to say about that. Just throwing that out there. A real privilege, at least as far as I'm concerned, to call round number five. Jimmy, in all the fights we've done, I think we're closing in on something like eight or 900. I yeah. think this is only the second time that we've gone into the fifth round of a fight. Wow, now you have me thinking about all the fights we have done. Most of them weren't five-rounders anyway, but. 
Good job of Ed West once again getting that guard back, staying tricky, but not threatening with any submissions. How fit are these two men, Ed West and Zach Makovsky? They look like it's round two. No, they haven't slowed down at all in this fifth round. Remember, coming up immediately after this bout, the, back. the final of Bellator's first ever heavyweight right tournament, Neil back, Grove versus Cole Conrad, the winner, will be crowned Bellator's inaugural world heavyweight champion. Going rubber guard here, getting to mission control. Now trying to isolate the arm for the Uma Plata. Getting very high with the guard. Do you think West realizes the urgency that he has to get a submission or some yeah. sort of finish? If he understands the fight, he does. And, and I'm, I give him too much credit in terms of his so fight guys, knowledge to work. not know he's behind. These are two really smart fighters, articulate people, very bright, very analytical. But this is exactly what we expected, a long fight, a tactical fight. Both fighters were very realistic about this fight's going to go to the distance. That's what everyone believed. That's what I believed. And that's exactly what's happening. You can see the knot on the forehead on the left side above the left eye of Ed West. And the cut that he suffered in the right brow has really been stopped. Rob Monroe, Dean Lassiter, Bellator's cut men, they travel with this every week, the best in the business. In lesser hands, that's a very leaky cut. Good ground and pound by Makovsky, trying to get that pass again. This round really about positioning and body control. I think this whole fight has been about positioning and body control. And it's been Zach Makovsky who's just been a little bit ahead of the curve. West again, somersaulting out. Single leg. West resisting that time. Successfully so. West has Makovsky against the cage. He's got to turn it on. He has one minute left. Some old school MMA. Two foot stomps by Ed West. Makovsky didn't even flinch. Shades of Marco Huas. Into the 25th and final minute of this fight. Again, the winner will be crowned Bellator's first ever world bantamweight champion. That kick by West blocked. After the end of round five, you will see the presentation of the title and Jimmy Smith will speak to the victor. Final 30 seconds. Ed West moving well, but he's got to land the kill shot in order to win this fight. The fitness level of these two is off the charts. Incredible. They're still moving like it's the first round. We knew they would come in in great shape, and they did. Dying seconds of this championship fight. The Let's bell, go. the end of the bout. When we return. About 50 to 45, while judges Brett Miller and Jackson Harper both see the fight 49 to 46. All for the winner by unanimous decision. And now, the new Bellator World Bantamweight Champion, Zach Funsize Markovsky. Bellator Fighting Championships along with Caesars, Atlantic City, routinely spectacular. Now, present five five-minute rounds for the Bellator Bantamweight World Championship. Sanctioned by the New Jersey State Athletic Control Board, Commissioner Aaron Davis, Council Nick Lembo. And now, introducing first fighting out of the red corner. At five foot seven, weighing in at 135 pounds, the season five tournament champion as a professional brings 13 victories, two defeats. From Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, introducing Dudu, Eduardo Dantas. And across the cage, the world champion fights out of the blue corner at five foot four, weighing in at 134 and one half pounds. Tonight, in his first title defense, he enters the cage with 14 professional victories, just two defeats. From Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, ladies and gentlemen, the defending Bellator Bantamweight World Champion, Zach. 
Fun-sized Makovsky. And the referee, charge of the action, Keith Peterson. Well, dude, we're giving you instructions. Touch cards if you like. Let's fight. This world title fight is under the unified rules of MMA. It is scheduled for five five-minute rounds. You see Eduardo Dantas, he's Stay in the white ready. trunks. Stay the champion, ready. Zach Makovsky, in the black trunks. Round number one. Keith Peterson is the referee. Makovsky fights in the southpaw stance at right leg forward. That's the power leg for a wrestler. I think that's why he boxes that way. Makes his takedown much easier. Makovsky missing with the kick. That head kick blocked. Dantas talking about timing his knee on the shots of Zach Makovsky. And Dantas knows the shots of Makovsky are coming. See already Dantas so low in his stance. Ready to sprawl, wants to keep himself low. He doesn't want to let Zach Makovsky get underneath his punches. Good knee. Makovsky's one of those wrestlers in MMA who doesn't bull his way in. He doesn't charge you and clinch. He tends to set it up and time his takedowns from the outside. That's an important distinction in this fight. Oh, man, big kick. Big kick, Makovsky partially dropped, partially slipped. I think more of a slip. That kick by Makovsky did not get through. See that right hand of Dantes is just glued to his chin. Dantes just missing with that right. Dantes five foot seven, Makovsky five foot four. Dantes a much different body type. Looks a lot taller, a lot longer than just the three inch height advantage. It looks like all legs. Look at the size of Dantes' legs. That's how he put so much juice on that kick. That's why those knees are so deadly. Makovsky trying to walk through with those punches. No shots yet, no takedown attempts yet from the world champion, Zach Makovsky. Man, what a kick. Big kick by Dawkins. Wow. There's the shot on the single leg. And there's the takedown, kicking out the back leg. Yeah, I think he's had enough of fighting on the outside with this kid. Clever by Makovsky. Went for the single leg, then kicked out Going the back leg. Going for the leg. Wow, he's locking up the Uma Plata right now. He's cranking on it. Beautiful Beautiful. turn by Makovsky to defend. Great mobility by Zach Makovsky. Closing in on the halfway point of round number one of this Bellator bantamweight world title fight. Eduardo Dantas versus the champion Zach Makovsky. Dantas looking for the up kick. Left hand on the dive in by Makovsky. Once again, going again, trying to isolate that right arm. Going a little bit of rubber guard here, reaching underneath. He's isolating the right arm of Zach Makovsky. You see Makovsky holding onto the leg with his left hand. That's what he needs to do. Dantas again thinking Uma Plata. He can also go wrist lock from here. Not a lot of guys do it. Makovsky popping free into the open guard now of Eduardo Dantas. Dantas trying to throw the right hand from his back. Good left hand passing the legs of Zach Makovsky. Dantas back to his feet. I trained with Novignon in Brazil for three weeks. Everyone there is spectacular on the ground. Everybody from blue belts on up. Very tricky guard game. Dantas in stalking mode at the moment. Well, certain times where being the fight quest guy and everybody wants to roll with you is a good thing. In Brazil, it's not good. <laughs> it's bad. Bouncing the step of Makovsky. Just coming forward. Makovsky on his bicycle. There's so much more to me than just the fight quest guy, Jimmy. <laughs> Thank you, Sean. I did love that show. As did everybody who <laughs> has anything to do with mixed martial arts. You are Elvis in this world. I took a lot of beatings, and I appreciate that uh, it's appreciated. Outside kick by Makovsky. Now, this is what Makovsky's having trouble with, is his outside game. What does he do from the outside? 
He's getting tagged with kicks. A shot from this distance is it's just too far. It's too easy to see. Single leg shot, and again the takedown by the champion. And he was able to get it. Right hand now from Makovsky. Man, I'm impressed with the balance of Eduardo Dantes right back to his feet. Look at the wrist control. Head kick by Eduardo Dantes. Dantes fainting with the step in. Lands the body kick. A good start to this world title fight. Three judges scoring cage side for the state of New Jersey. Jimmy on your unofficial scorecard. 10-9, Eduardo Dantes. Mikowski got the takedown, but Dantes not just sitting there, going for submissions, able to get back to the feet where he has been controlling the action. Dantes landing another kick. I'm surprised he's not throwing more jabs. A lot of fighters, when they take on a wrestler, don't throw a lot of kicks. They don't want to get him caught. But he's throwing a ton of kicks. Look at the redness on the ribs of Zach Mikowski, Sean. Mikowski trying to throw a head kick, finding no joy. Cut kick, go inside. Kofsky staying on his toes. A lot of bounce in his step. Walking through, landing the right uppercut. Oh, man. Good combination by Dantes, but man, back to his feet. And again, the takedown. Oh, beautiful switch. Man, that is textbook wrestling. Right hands now from Eduardo Dantes. Into side control. That's a wrestling move. The outside switch beautifully executed. You see the knee on the belly by Eduardo Dantes. Now this is a position we haven't really seen Zach Mikowski in. On his back, fighting off against a great jiu-jitsu black belt. Full mount now. Full mount to Chief Mikowski looking to go out the back door and could not find it. What you don't want with Zach Mikowski is a scramble. You might win a tight jiu-jitsu game like this, but you don't want to scramble. He's very compact, he's very fast. Of course, that wrestling background, you got to keep tight on this kid. Mikowski, even though he was a Division I college wrestler, he said, I'm not a great wrestler, I don't have great jiu-jitsu, but I am very proficient in both. That's true, jack of all trades. But Dantes, I think, the superior jiu-jitsu in this position. I think Zach Mikowski's guard game versus Dantes' top game is no contest. He's going to have a hard time sweeping or catching Eduardo Dantes from here. Close guard now from the champion, Zach Mikowski. Dantes relentless thus far in this fight. Pulling out the leg, looking to dive in. Big wide right hand by Eduardo Dantes. And look at the pressure. Man, that is Novignon. They know when to put pressure on, and they know when to stay light and move. Oh, now he's in trouble. Giving his back, out. taking it away, but falls into the full mount of Eduardo Dantes. Dantes letting go. And he's up against the fence. Very hard to move here. The second time in round two that Dantes has achieved full mount on Zach Mikowski. Big shots from the top from Dantes. And he is unloading on the champ, going for the rear naked, but he's not in good hip position. Mikowski continuing to move, but stuck on head. the ground. Well, look at that MMA jiu-jitsu. He doesn't go hard for something that he doesn't have. He'd rather sit up and punch than go too hard for the rear naked. Good ring sense there. You see, he pulled him off the cage and walked him a little bit toward the center of the cage so we can't uh, cage walk out. Now going for the head and arm choke. Head and arm choke, it's that from Eduardo Dantes. And that's a Novignon specialty. Shaolin, so good at this choke, you know he passed it on to Eduardo Dantes. That is very good. That's tough. it. And that is it. out. A technical submission. Markovsky is out cold. And Eduardo Dantes is the new Bellator Bantamweight World Champion. Man. Is a great performance against a great fighter. Man, I am impressed, Sean. I am stunned. 23 year old Eduardo Dantes, the prodigy from Brazil, is the champion of the world at 135 pounds. Even this pro Zach Mikowski crowd is on its feet. Man, let's see if we can get another look at that. Man. On top, stepped over. This is how you do a side choke, an arm triangle choke. Zach Mikowski did the correct escape, trying to get space, but look at that pressure. No chance. 
great refereeing. He saw he was out and ends up stopping him. You see here, has the head right next to the head of Zach Witkowski. Can't pull his left arm out. He tries to kick to get space, but no chance. Beautiful job by the Novignon black belt. He is elated. He is our new champion. Ladies and gentlemen, inside the Bellator cage, the arm triangle choke brings this fight to a halt. Official time, three minutes, 26 seconds into round number two. The winner by technical submission, and now the new Bellator bantamweight world champion, Gugu Eduardo Dantas. Introducing first the red corner at five foot eight, weighing in 136.9 pounds. The tournament winner brings an impressive professional record of 21 victories, only three defeats. Hailing from Camboriú, Santa Catarina, Brazil, Rafael Mosego Silva. And across the cage, his opponent fighting out of the blue corner at five foot six, weighing in 134.6 pounds. Tonight, looking to become a two-time, two-weight class Bellator World Champion, he enters with 10 professional victories, three defeats, fighting out of Monument, Colorado. Ladies and gentlemen, the baddest man on the planet, Joe Warren. In charge of the action, Gasper Oliver. Guys, you know the rules. Let's keep this fight clean. Protect yourself all the time. Obey my commands. You understand? All right, let's touch gloves. Touch gloves. All right, step back, please. Jimmy, your keys to victory are presented by there. Victory Motorcycles. Warren. Right Warren. one in your there, right? one. Remember, Joe Warren has been knocked out at 135. He wants to test Joe's chin and stay busy on the ground. Don't let Joe Warren just put pressure on him. For Joe Warren, close that distance, make it a Greco fight, and keep the pressure on. He prides himself on his conditioning. Scheduled for five five-minute rounds. Are you ready? Are you ready? Fight! The bell in round number one. Tonight's fight clock is brought to you by Miller Lite. It's the official beer of Bellator, and it's not just a good time, it's Miller time. Silva looking for the outside trip. Stop grabbing cages. Brazilian Rafael Silva is in the white trunks. Joe Warren is in the black trunks. Man, Rafael's committed to this takedown. And he beautiful. True to what he told us. He did, man. Greco Roman world champion just picked him up and dropped him. Silva now taking the back, both hooks in. Welcome to exactly where he didn't want to be, on the ground, both hooks in. Complaining that he's grabbing the glove. You can grab your own glove, you cannot grab your opponent's glove. Silva talking to Gasper Oliver about that issue. This is uncharted territory for the most part for Joe Warren. He's used to being on top and in control on the ground. Good explosion back to the feet. Trying to turn. Nice short knee. Silva Jimmy staying very tight. Right hands now from Warren. Silva just not giving Warren any space. None at all. And you think this is where Warren wants to be. Wonder between Greco and differences between Greco and freestyle. It's very close. There's almost no space in Greco. <laughs> Big knee to the body from Warren. Now some separation. Reset, reset. Stiff left hand from Warren. Trying to lock up the guillotine. He's cranking it hard. And lost it. Warren, though, holding top position. Both fighters being extremely aggressive, round number one. And we're seeing a lot of new skills. Rafael going hard for the takedown, taking down Joe Warren, and Joe Warren trying to submit the submission specialist. Rafael Silva looking for the up kick. 
Smart by Warren. Dropped to one knee to ground himself, taking away the legal option of a head kick. To the rib cage from Warren. Right now, Joe staying very safe. But his way too far forward. Now trying to turn the corner on Silva. Silva with the body lock. Now to the step of Warren. Now moving forward, center of the Bellator cage. Nothing with that jump knee. Silva nice to the body. Cut. Tendency one has had in the past. He rushes in without moving his head. That was a good uppercut. That hurt him. Another good right hand. hand. Uppercut. Silva not looking to finish. Warren fires back. Man, he had him hurt. Crushing right uppercut thrown and delivered by Rafael Silva. And that takedown, I think, really saved Warren. He was hurt. He was eating right hands. Looks like he's clearing the cobwebs here. Silva looking to sweep. Now sitting up. Oh, my God. And I, I, and I don't think that was an up kick. I think he was going for a triangle. Saw a warning there, but I think he was throwing his leg up for a triangle, Sean. I agree with you, Jimmy. Just a foot moving the position rather than an intended kick from Rafael Silva. That's how I saw it anyway. So he's in triangle position, he's controlling that wrist, can't step over. Tight close guard from Silva. Warren, heavy pressure with his forearm. This is where Warren has done so much damage in past fights. On top, in the guard, wearing his opponents down. We're looking for the hammer fist now. Very aggressive round number one from both fighters. Jimmy, how did you score round one? Based a lot on that ability to hurt Warren, I went 10-9 Silva. I gave him the edge in the striking. Got a takedown of his own, but... 10-9 Silva, man. Once again, getting back to it with the jab. <laughs> Silva said, I'm superior in every aspect of fighting of Joe Warren. And I said, does that include wrestling? He said, yes, it does. He said, Joe Warren has no idea the level of wrestling that I possess. Yeah. Joe Warren but won in Greco-Roman wrestling both a world championship and a world cup. I remember watching him when he was at the University of Michigan. All-American there, you know, he's got a good double leg, good folk style as well. Separation from Silva's Warren tried to take the back. <laughs> the question is, as this fight goes into the deeper water, Silva did not have the notice Joe Warren had. Joe Warren's been training for a long time for this fight. Prides himself on his conditioning, on his work ethic. And Silva win a long fight. The bounce in the step of Warren as he moves backwards. You can tell he's, that Silva's been working on that uppercut to catch Joe Warren coming in. Spinning back kick, that lands. Quick with that right hand release. Close with the uppercut and the straight right. Problem is Joe is falling back into bad habits. We saw early in his career, rushing in and taking punches. Getting the uppercut, that landed big for Silva in round one. Shot from Warren. Warren with the trip gets the takedown. The problem is that Warren hasn't had an easy time stabilizing on Silva. He's taking him down, but Silva doing a good job getting space, getting back to his feet, making him work all over again. Warren just missing with that right hand. And Warren's eating a lot of punches. One of the questions, I, oh, nice uppercut again. Silva looking to turn up the volume with his strikes, turn up the power. One of the questions I had coming into this fight, 
After the knockouts by Alexis Vila, the beating by Pat Kern was his chin shot. Could he still take a punch? He's shown that he can. The bad news is he's showing that he can. He's eating a lot of punches. <laughs> What do you say, Jimmy? You never want to be known for taking You never punch. want to be known for your chin. There's something wrong with that. Jump knee from Warren, caught, and then dropped by Silva. Right back to his feet. Silva did not pounce. He's having, I think he's confident on the feet. He's doing well with his punches. Slip off of the spinning back kick that didn't land. Warren did pounce. Doesn't want to do that, though. One forty-five remaining round two. Warren right now just sitting on this position, looking for him to turn and burn, try and take the back. Man, good job by Silva. Talked about his work ethic, I talked about the notice he's had, but he looks very fatigued right now, Sean. Trying to get back to his feet, he does. Beautiful job taking him back down by Silva. When he told us that, I'm going to out-wrestle him. Uh, you and I looked at each other like, hey, I don't know if that's a good idea. It's working out for him so far. I'm impressed with his wrestling. As am I. Final minute now, round number two. The people at home don't understand if you don't follow wrestling at the, at the college level or at the international level, there's a lot to it that doesn't translate to MMA. The turns, some of the throws, the point system, it's pretty much takedowns in MMA. Yeah. Right hand from Warren. Yeah. You say all day, oh, I've, been, I've been wrestling my whole life, but a lot of that's dedicated to things that don't necessarily translate to MMA. In MMA, it's mostly about the takedown. Some control elements, but you know, the freestyle turns, stuff like that don't work. See the wrist control? Warren back to his feet, eats a knee. Silva, true to his word, has gone for takedowns and has tried to out-wrestle Joe Warren. Closing seconds now, round number two. Here comes round three. A victory gives Joe Warren Bellator's interim bantamweight world championship, makes him a Bellator two-weight division champion. Previously held the title at featherweight. Rafael Silva. Looking for 14 straight victories. Jimmy, how do you have it? I have it two rounds to none for Rafael Silva, both 10-9. Based on his, basically his ability to land good punches on the feet, on the ground. Warren not able to, oh my god, big hit right hand. hand. Head kick attempt from Warren, missed the mark. Warren though being cautious, then eats a left hand as he steps in. As Silva cleared the cobweb, cobwebs, that was a big right, good right of his own. Jimmy Warren landed that big right and then did not step in aggressively. Said, apparently decided to go back to his Street Fighter experience. <laughs> Threw a flying, <laughs> jumping kick. I don't know why he would do that. Oh, wow! Huge right hand from Silva. Warren driving for the takedown and he gets it. That was a big technical mistake by Warren. Had him hurt and then... So watch blood sport too many times. I don't know what the deal was with that. Alvarez Chandler three, Rampage King Mo. It's our Bellator pay-per-view live Saturday night, May 17th. Starts with our prelim show. You will see that on Spike, 7 p.m. Eastern time. Just for clarification, our prelims live and free on Spike, 8 p.m. Eastern, 7 Central. Our pay per view broadcast will begin 10 p.m. Now, this is what Silva can't afford to do is sit on the bottom, let your warm work him over, take the energy out of him with his ground and pound. He cannot allow this to happen. See the blood on the face of Joe Warren. Short elbow. Finding that. 
Four finishes in 10 victories. Joe Warren generally wears fighters out. He does it here on top with his grounded pound. Silva can't sit here and be passive if he wants to win this fight. It's a five round or two rounds in the bank will not do it. So Warren stacking Rafael Silva. Goes back to close guard. We're starting to land from in tight, Jimmy. Looks like Silva's taking a break here. Silva with a high guard, but not angling his hips. Now looks like he's looking for an arm. Tucking for that arm. arm. And the elbow's out. He's not going to get it. Now throwing knees to defend. Out of armbar danger is Joe Warren. Short elbow from Warren. This is Bellator Live on Spike coming to you tonight from Revel in Atlantic City, New Jersey. At stake, the interim Bantamweight World Championship. Rafael Silva, the Brazilian in the bottom position, Joe Warren. Won the world title of Bellator 145, trying to do it at 135. Leading with his head. A lot of swelling blood around Warren's left eye. It's the first time in the fight that Warren has been able to dictate the action, has been on top, and has been able to keep Silva grounded. Big elbows. Those are illegal. They're off the spine. <laughs> 25 seconds remaining, round three. Scheduled for five five minute rounds. Warren looking to grind away, holding this top position. Half guard of Rafael Silva. We're headed to the chip. Are you ready? Are you ready? A lot of damage Fight. above Joe Warren's left eye. Montoya, between rounds, telling his man Joe Warren, top position, that's where we want you to be. Jimmy, how do you have to score? Take down from Warren. I have a two rounds to one. I gave Joe Warren the last round, 10-9. This is where Warren wants to be. Just like his corner said, on top, taken over with ground and pound. First time that either fighter, Jimmy, has gone past three rounds. Holding on to the leg. Silva working his way free back to his feet. That's the question. Now that we're in the championship rounds, does Silva have the gas to keep up with Warren? Warren in the past has always made it about guts, heart, his endurance. Round and pound in round number three, 22 to one for Joe Warren, starting to pull away. Starting to make things like conditioning a factor in this fight. Silva trying to control the, an the ankle, throwing the left hand. That last shot from Silva was from distance, Jimmy. <laughs> Joe Warren's career, no one has ever shot on him from distance in MMA. Short knee from Silva. Big power takedown from Warren. So this swelling outside of Silva's left eye. Going on top. See that severe swelling in the cut. Left eyelid of Joe Warren. Doesn't seem to be a factor though right now. Yeah, but this is a bad position for Silva to be in. He's to explode, get back to his feet. One hook in, but a lot of weight, a lot of pressure. 
is how you let round slip away when you're fighting Joe Warren. Warren trying to take the back off Rafael Silva, one hook in. Trying to get the second hook in. Joe now in full mount. Can't keep it though. Silva exploding into a waist stitch. Silva's been very slippery, very creative with his ground game. The last two rounds has been Joe Warren being the aggressor. Mike Crotch could take down from Warren. Starting to really implement his wrestling now, Jimmy. Oh, going for the switch. Joe Warren, though, scrambling right with him. Now going to the power half. It's another wrestling move. See how little space Warren is giving Silva right now. <laughs> Silva right now really has to dig to get back in this fight. Because this is what Joe Warren lives for the last 10 minutes. Championship rounds is what Warren lives for. Gaspar Oliver just warned Joe Warren elbow to the back of the head. And Silva a little too focused on the takedown at this point in the fight. I think he might want a little distance and work on that eye. But these wrestling exchanges, both guys grappling like this, Joe Warren's been wrestling his whole life. You know, he's gonna spend a lot less energy in these positions. looking for a pile driver position <laughs> like a gut wrench suplex. It would be illegal, by the way, you cannot spike your opponent. Not with the pile driver from pro wrestling and not even a Corellan lift. Ten seconds remaining, round number four. Warren spinning effortlessly to the back. Time. We will go to the fifth and final round. Fight. On the line, Bellator's interim bantamweight world championship. Jimmy, how do you have this? I agree completely with Marcelo Brigadero. I think it's 2 2. I think whoever wins this fifth round wins this fight. I also agree when he said he should not be shooting, trying to take Warren down. Warren jumping onto the back of Rafael Silva. You see, he's keeping himself grounded. Not that there's any danger of being kneed to the head at the moment. So they're trying to explode. Warren matching it. Rafael Silva versus Joe Warren. Fifth and final round of this Bellator interim bantamweight world title fight. Rafael Silva going for the switch with Joe Warren staying so tight. A takedown differential, that's been the difference, especially, especially later on in the fight after round number two. That's when Joe Warren's been taken over. Very good job, Jimmy, of holding position. Really, since the start of round four, he's given Silva standing and on the ground very little space. No warning by the referee here yet. That's an illegal knee. Silva was grounded. Time called by Gaspar Oliver. Silva grounded himself with his right hand. I thought his hands were You have to be control yourself, okay? 
Stay right there. Stay I'm sorry. Hey, stay right there. Bro. Big look at it here. Yeah, both hands on the mat. Stay right there. Don't worry about it. It's an illegal knee. Doesn't look egregious, doesn't look like a, a, a point taking knee, but you never know. That's a judgment call. Come on up. Sit right here. Come on up. Sit down. Ask him how he's feeling. He's all right. Go over there. You're going to be dizzy about this. You're a little dizzy. You want the doctor to come here and check you? Okay. Okay. No, no, no. no? You sure? Yeah. Okay, so we're going to fight right now. Okay? Yeah. All right. Go Olha aqui. Center do octógono. Right Did the unified okay. rules, low blow, you're given five minutes. Be in control, okay? The situation okay. court on a reasonable be in control, amount of time. Right? Oh, stay right there. You ready? Are you ready? Ready? Fight! Sorry. Brigadero declined the doctor for Silva. Time in. Our fifth and final round continues. So sorry, touches gloves, punches him in the face. Welcome to MMA. Or right back to the inside. See Silva keeping himself grounded. Knees to the thigh, now to the rib cage. Silva though has to come up with something big. Halfway through the fifth round. This is a Joe Warren kind of fight. Absolutely. Grind, grind, grinding, smothering top control. This is what he wants. And he was also rocked in the stand-up. Fight, fight. Virtually every fight. How can his wife, Christy, continue to turn out? Her husband always gets punched hard, win or lose. Things going the way of Joe Warren right now, implementing his wrestling, his top game, his positional dominance over Rafael Silva. Nothing, I mean nothing, though, has been settled or decided yet. 145 remaining round five. The pressure's on Silva right now. <laughs> Keeps going this way. So Warren wins this fight. Just like he did against Pitbull when he was throwing up before the fight. Doesn't matter. He keeps the pressure on when Joe Soto was having his way with him in the opening round. He came back, knocked him out in the second round. He makes it about heart and guts. Trying to land from very short range. Minute 25. Warren just relentless with his top game position, Jimmy. I think he's about a minute away from being a champion once again. Talked about all the new skills he had acquired, all the stuff he was doing better. Turned out to be the stuff he always had, the wrestling, the endurance. That proved the difference in this fight to me on my scorecard. Fifteen seconds remaining. Warren not giving up position. Ten seconds. Looking to land in the final seconds. Short elbows from Warren. More elbows. The bell and the end of the fight. Ladies and gentlemen, having gone the distance inside the bell door cage, we'll go to your judges' scorecards. All three judges, Ricardo Almeida, Eric Colon and Carlo Urso all see the fight exactly the same at 48 to 47. All for the winner by unanimous decision. And now the interim Bellator Bantamweight World Champion, the baddest man on the planet, Joe Warren. 
Let's see how these two fighters line up with our tale of the tape. Sports. Similar records, both guys used to going the distance a lot. Heart, gas, a huge factor in this fight. For five five five-minute rounds, and here we go with round number one. What I'm looking for in this first round is who's going to make this statement, I'm not locked up in here with you, you're locked up in here with me. Cage generalship is going to be huge in this fight. Who's the bully? Blue gloves for the Brazilian Galvão, red gloves for the world champion Joe Warren. Galvão talked about his ability to take Joe Warren down. That would be huge. One to the body. And hits the takedown. From the body lock. Demonstrating that top level Greco Roman wrestling pedigree there. Galvão back to his feet and he gets the reversal. Galvão showing that Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belt pedigree there. Two amazing ground fighters who talked a lot about standing and banging in this fight. But here we are on the mat. Both guys are making statements. Galvão saying, You're not going to have your way with me in that top game. I'm going to fight. Joe Warren now making a statement, you're not just gonna pass my guard easily, doing a good job of getting space with the butterfly guard. It's gonna be hard to keep Joe Warren down. Side knee from Galvo. Again the knee. There's the separation. Warren pulls Galvo into the center of the cage. Marcos Galvo versus Bellator's Bantamweight World Champion Joe Warren. 220 remaining round one. Very measured, very methodical thus far, Jimmy. Contrast to how the fight started between these two April 2011. All action in the early stages. More action there, Warren the right hand. The takedown, Galvo right back to his feet. So far it's Warren dictating, so far pushing the pace. Not having an easy time with the takedown, but going for it. Being the aggressor so far against Galvo. Warren again, you see very high on the body of Galvo. Watch where it's at, Joe. Sure. It's in the leg. The one thing Galvão does not want to get into is that idea that it's good enough stopping the takedown. He has to get his own offense going. In these positions, Warren is the one being the aggressor. He's the one throwing. Galvão has to find his own offense. It isn't enough to just stay on his feet against Warren. Knees to the thigh by Warren out of this body lock. Galvão punching back. Short high knee again. Is looking for the throw, nothing there. Now Galvo walks forward. Big swing and a miss from Warren. Hands high for Marcos Galvo. Lands that right hand. Step in knee. One thing Galvo took advantage of in the first fight was Joe Warren's reckless aggression. Joe Warren much tighter in his last few fights. Hands higher, more head movement, not just charging forward. Galvo's going to have to find his openings. Warren looking for the late takedown. Final stages, round number one. 
McCarthy telling Galvo, don't grab the fence. Warren again to the body lock. Good start to this fight. Marcos Galvo trying to make the most of second chances. Not only this, a rematch versus Joe Warren, this is Galvo's second shot at Bellator's bantamweight world title. February of third, February 2013, Galvo lost to then champion Eduardo Dantes by second round knockout. Galvo so much more calm, so much more measured coming to this fight than either against Warren the first time or against Dantes two years ago. Warren for a leg lock, he's in knee bar position, he's get Joe's weight off that leg. Trying to stack Galvo. Oh, he's got it! And that, is deep. that is tight! Look at the torque! Look at the face of Joe Warren! The he screams! Screams. That's it! That is it! That is a verbal submission on the screen! And we have a new champion! It is Marcos Galvo! Warren is protesting, but he screamed. You scream, that's it! That is a verbal submission! We have a new champion! Man, as soon as Laurel got that leg straight, that was incredible hip pressure. Warren was hanging on, but you look up and you scream like that, and that is it. You heard the scream, McCarthy immediately in, and Galvo is Bellator's new world champion. Ladies and gentlemen, inside the Bellator cage, the vocal stream constitutes as a verbal submission. Official time, 45 seconds into round number two. My submission now, the new Bellator bantamweight world champion, the Brazil, Marcos Lolo Galvão. Time now to check out the tail of the tape. Both the same number of wins, but look past the numbers. Galvan has lost to Dantes before. It's all about changes. You ready? You ready? Get up! In the first fight, Jimmy, the speed of Dantes was too much. Yeah, it certainly was. He throws tight combinations. Almost never throws one shot at a time. I think Galvan needs to get this to the floor to slow him down. That's what Joe Warren did. That's the successful strategy against a quick, hungry, fast opponent. Dantes was so efficient. He threw one leg kick in the first fight. It was devastating to Galvo late in the first round. He threw one uppercut, and that was the shot to finish the fight. See, Galvan is very heavy-handed, but that makes him heavy-footed to plant and throw big punches. Makes him vulnerable to late kicks, doesn't move a whole lot. Selka <laughs> Hall reacts to everything, every feint. It's a bad sign, he's got a lot of nerves. Waiting on Dantes a little too much. He's yet to even throw. One late kick, but hasn't let his hands go. One left hook. See the quick, he's in and out, here's Dantes. Right now, the difference in hand speed and foot speed as well. Apparent for Dantes. I think Galvan might be trying to kind of 
drag Dantas into a slower, longer fight. Stay cautious early. Don't give up anything big. Make a little more about deep water, but he's got to get his own offense going. That was a 90-second stretch in the first fight, late in the first round, where Galvo got Dantas against the fence, but he could never get him to the ground, not once. Remember, cage rust wise, it's been over a year for both of these two. They have prepared to face each other only twice to be delayed. Paul doing a lot of waiting, a lot of looking, but no initiating at all. Much more willing to exchange in the first fight, and it cost him. He remembers that, he remembers it well. Well, he's trying to counter punch, but he doesn't really have much of a counter punching style. It's never been his strong suit. Trickle of blood to the left nostril of Galvo as one of those shots got through, and that right there was the story of the first fight. Dantas was in and out before Galvo could do anything. Galvo's never been a technician. I mean, he throws big punches, naturally heavy-handed, very aggressive. He's never been a technical guy, never sets footwork traps, things like that. Things would nullify speed. He's never been that great at that. Thought he'd maybe go to his wrestling earlier in this fight. He hasn't even tried yet. Marcos Galvo three years ago could not solve the puzzle of Eduardo Dantas and five minutes into the rematch, it doesn't look like he's made progress. No. Same problem, same physical disparity, it's the speed. On the feet, he just can't match the speed of Eduardo Dantas. He has to make this a grappling match. Nullify that explosiveness with his jiu-jitsu, with this technique. He isn't the wrestler Joe Warren is. That was the kryptonite for Dantes. He's just going to get picked apart at this range. It was not a coincidence that the title went the way it did. When you talk about you know fighter A, fighter B, and fighter C, they were, it was a matchup thing with Galvo and Dantes and Warren. Now the specter of Darren Caldwell looming over the winner of this fight. We wondered, yeah, and we wondered in the first fight if Dantes would have that killer instinct when he needed it to get the knockout, and he clearly did. That's when they were much closer than they are now. The emotion dripping off the fighters, the corners, everybody connected to that first fight. That was a tough one. Marlo Dantes in the cage, standing over his fallen teacher. Marcos Galvo said, we fought like men. We came in and we did our job. Don't feel bad. Don't be mad at me, was the message in the heat of the moment. Don't be mad at me. This was our job. 
Marcos Galvo saying he was too kind to Dantas three years ago. This isn't about being kind, he just hasn't figured out the puzzle. You see what Dantas has, which is a healthy respect for the power of Galvon. Usually when a guy's this much faster and landing effectively from the outside, they push in and look for that big shot, and Dantas has yet to do that. Oh, nice right, right through. The younger and faster Eduardo Dantas starting to land. See what he does, it's in combination. Basically the jab is the only punch that comes out by itself. Galvan is in danger of becoming a spectator. He's watching these punches, he's not throwing back. Seems dazzled by the speed of Eduardo Dantes. You see it all the time with guys like, you know, Eduardo Dantes, MVP, guys that have that seemingly superhuman speed, guys end up watching, waiting for the next strike to come, rather than getting their own offense going. Five round fight, Marcos Galvo had more room to give. He had time to be patient, but that time is running out. Down to staring him now, man. Daring him, mugging a little bit. Trying to open up countering opportunities. Best shot for Gabo. It's not saying a whole lot. That wasn't a very good one. Even going in, he's ducking. He's gun shy. He's yes. hesitant. Waiting for the shot to hit him. Not a takedown attempt, not a level change. Nothing yet from Gabo. Got this simply his kryptonite. Heard that in your living room. But you don't hear the counter. There's a huge difference when they land strikes. Dante so far sharper, crisper. Marcos Galvan still trying to find his way in. All challenger Dante through two. Eduardo. Eduardo. You gotta, you gotta put that pressure on, you gotta get off first, okay? Yeah? Here? Sorry. Here is no good. You gotta be close, you gotta be close, you gotta be close, all right? Outra coisa. Tá bloqueando o chute dele. Entra com giratão e cruza, tá? Entendeu? Eduardo Dantas has had it his way through the first two rounds. You see it here. Nice work with the lead hand, trying to find a home for the right. Hasn't really staggered Galvão yet. But he has been like the death of a thousand cuts. Those bee stings, he's constantly on him, very accurate, very sharp. And it seems, Jimmy, it seems he's in his head. Yeah, completely. Nothing worse than get, getting reminded of that fight you lost, that opportunity you lost, and this fight's looking exactly the same Ready. right now. Get up. Galvo is still standing here in round three, which he wasn't three years ago. Clearly, at some point, time will run out. And a pretty easy call, obviously, through two rounds. Kind of what we thought last month, but that's another story. At what point does Gabo have to make his move? I would say now. I said mid midway through round three, he's got to turn the tide of this fight. Mathematically, he waits past three, he could be completely out of it. That, that reaching takedown from outside, that's not going to do it. And the longer you wait, the more punishment you have taken, the worse it gets. Mm -hmm. 
Face of the champion tells the story. Look at the footwork of Dante. He never stops. He's always angling, always moving, always giving you different looks. Galvao's the kind of guy who likes to set up and have you square in front of him and throw big punches. Dante is never there. Dantas gaining in confidence here. More comfortable moving forward. On the daring Galvão is daring. And this is a guy, Galvão, who usually, usually when he boxes, he boxes kind of recklessly. Throws big punches, wide power shots. Hasn't done that at all. Not to start to Roy Jones in a little bit, and these are getting through. The right eye is close. It is. It's swelling badly. We are getting near desperation time for the world champion. At some point, he needs that one opening to roll the dice and change the level and change this fight. He is fading away. It's an output issue, not an accuracy issue. It hasn't thrown very much at all. Another nice left hook. So it's so it's visceral damage done to the face of Marcos Galvão. When you get a chance, look at the lead leg right there above the left knee. It has been a one-sided dominant performance by the challenger. Knocked out Galvão in round two three years ago. Trying to become a two-time world champion. No comparison in the hand speed. No comparison at all. Maybe too much power as well. The punches are starting to knock Galvão back. Dantes is committing more to his punches. Why? Because he doesn't have any fear anymore. I think he had respect. Oh, and Galvão takes a yep. big left. Having trouble seeing in that right eye. That respect is gone, Sean. As he lost that opportunity, as he waited too long. <laughs> this round, man, a technical wipeout. This fight a technical wipeout, but in this third round, the, the power is really starting to assert itself. I think Dantes is thinking about a finish. Beautiful shot. He's been thinking about it since the later stages of round two. Yeah. He lost whatever fear he had of Galvão. The champion game still on his feet. Still looking for the fight changing moment. But that belt is slipping from his grasp. This crowd seems to like that Ric Flair chant. We've been hearing that a lot. Eduardo Dantes, if he wins the title, he'd still have a few he'd need to catch up to Ric Flair's oh, record. But man, he is closed again on his second Bantamweight World title. And Whitehand just cannot miss. I don't know how much longer this fight's going to go at this pace. You thought the beating he put on Galvo three years ago or something, Dantes has been even more dominant through three tonight. Better work on him. Taking a little too much punishment in this fight, all right? How are you feeling? I called this last round a 10-8 because you see accumulation of damage catching up to Marcos Galvão. You pointed out the damage on the leg. It was mostly the right hand, the laser-like punches. Look at him here. Sharp combinations, crisp, accurate, not winging punches, hitting him with three, four at a time. The right side of, Gal of Galvão's face is a mess. Dantes looks fantastic. I went 10-8 I went in round three. This is where the numbers can be misleading because that tells you the number of shots landed. 
the face of Marcos Galvo and the leg of Marcus Galvo tells you about the power of those shots. It sounds like a 22 going off when he lands that leg kick against Galvo. The question is, can you see out of that right eye? We know. We know. Yeah. I, I would say it's one of those, look, I'll give you one more round kind of moments. Ready? Get on. The championship rounds of a fight and has been dominated by the challenger. Marcos Galvon, you're in his corner, you tell him. Doctor's probably gonna give you one more round. At the end of this round, it's the same as last round. This fight might, might be over. Galvo takes his shot. But does he have enough left in the tank to get the fight where he needed to get it early? Watch your attack. What's important to keep in mind is Dantes also has great jujitsu. It's not like a takedown and, oh, this fight's in the bag. I mean, you still have to beat a guy who has outstanding jujitsu. And is the much fresher fighter at this stage. And knows your game. And they're from the same team. If you know a teammate well, you can stall. You can stay out of trouble. You went 10-8 in round three. I went 10-8 in round three. I don't know if the judges will. I just thought the damage was starting to accumulate. It's much more powerful punches. It was a one-sided fight, one-sided round statistically. And he was doing fight-ending kind of damage. It's finish or bust right now. And you're also thinking of the way he's performing, where he has, isn't competitive so far in the fight. His corner might be thinking about stopping him between round four and five. He keeps going the way it's been going. Dantas, when he lost the leg to Galvo, just hopped back towards the fence where he'd be much safer. Dante's vulnerable to the wrestling of Joe Warren. Joe Warren had a world title at Greco, All-American in free, I mean in uh, folk style for University of Michigan. Galvan just didn't wrestle on that level. Oh man, look at the timing on that. Elite level wrestling in that. And now the uppercut that finished the first fight got through. Full credit here for Dantas. He is way, way up, and he is still looking to finish it. Like a champion. Oh man, look at that beautiful switch. Galvo can't see these coming. Yeah. Briefly in the southpaw stance, could not see that lead left. Man, Dantas confident right now. As he should be. He's been a world championship masterful performance from Eduardo Dantas. Talk about the heart of a champion. And Marcos Galvo still standing there. He's taking shot after shot, still looking for an opening that may not come. He hasn't backed up. He hasn't even been throwing strikes. That's that's the amazing thing is maybe worried about the counter, but just standing there getting beat up is not helping him. When you can't see, he starts to cover up even before Dantas. Begins to attack. Remember, opening half of the first round, he was overreacting, reacting to every feint. The memories of that first fight, and he just too much in his head. Marcos Galvão has been game, but for four rounds, he has just taken a beating from one of the elite bantamweights in the world. Have no illusions about that. I've said it before, sometimes heart just makes a beating more interesting because he hasn't had a tactical response to the offense of Eduardo Dantes. 
There is not a mark on Eduardo Dantas. Yeah, that student teacher thing is pretty much gone. Yeah, completely. Is it going to be a fifth round? If I was his corner, I don't know if I'd let him go out there. The way he's fighting, he's standing there getting punched. I, I don't know if I'd let him go out there. I really don't know if I would. It's one of those things where I have to look very closely at the corner. If you don't see a light at the end of the tunnel, if you don't see a, okay, keep doing X, Y, or Z, you have a way out of this position, are you sending your guy out there for, a, for another five-minute beating? For his forearm? Kind of puffy? Let's take a look at how some of that damage you're looking at was done. Combinations, kicks, punches, everything in bunches. You can't go to the left anymore. You got to go to the right. Look at it right through the guard. And the shot that dropped him in the last fight, followed up with the left hook. You got to do something. It doesn't look like the corner's going to stop, but they're letting right? him go out you there again. If you up like that, he's going to tear you apart. You got to get close to him. You got to take him down. You got to go and to the right. And I see why he's not in terrible off. shape. I mean, I don't see anything any long term that's going to be a problem, but it, it's one of those, look, you didn't show me anything. You got to show me something that you want this fight to change things around. Do you, you know what I mean? Does he have a chance to win in round five? Because you said the light at the end of the tunnel. Hey, you got to show me something. Okay? Here you, go. Okay. you ready? One of the most anticipated rematches in Bellator history. We have seen one of the most dominant performances in a championship fight in Bellator history from Eduardo Dantes through four. Where is the Hail Mary for a world of battle? It's got to be on the ground. I mean, it, Galvan's just got to get him down and, and finish him. But once again, you're dealing with a high-level black belt Brazilian national champion. It's not as though it would be a wipeout if you got him there. So that's why I was wondering if they'd send him out for this round, just because there, there isn't much of a light at the end of the tunnel. There's no, clear path, there's no clear path to victory. Could, could he get the finish without doing damage first? And he's shown no ability yeah. to do any damage. Yeah, he can't set up the takedown. And he doesn't have that, that elite level grappling where he can shoot from halfway across the cage and maybe catch him. Got to feint his way in, and Dante's just having his way with him on the field. Let's go. Work. Pulling guard, okay. Trying to change it up, trying to do something different. And it would be very difficult for him to catch Dante from his back. And not backing off, he's willing to engage. See how long this stays there, nope. Dante was thinking about it, you know he, he was. was thinking about it. He was. Now, he needs dominant position, I think, to catch Dante. He's not gonna catch him from the guard, especially at this point in the fight. You can only see out of one eye. Dantas is still fresh. Oh, just emptying the playbook here. After a month in which there has been so much discussion about judging in MMA, sometimes all you need is the visual. You don't need a judge. Look at the confidence of Dantes. Crowd getting on him a bit, but we talked about the things that have changed in the three years with these two fighters. But one thing that has changed is any hesitation or respect. And Eduardo Dantes may have overpaid to Galvo the first time around. It's gone. Not even close.
This was just a vicious combination of technical, of taunt, on, and of violence. This was a masterpiece. This fight was not even close. And what's kind of disturbing to me about it is it was eerily similar to the first fight, just longer, more brutal. I'm sure he tried to make adjustments based on the speed differential, just couldn't do it, either in the gym or in the cage tonight. He knew what he was walking into and still seemed completely unprepared. I think Dodge has taken his foot off the gas a little bit in this last week. He has. He really gave it an effort to finish it in rounds three and four. Couldn't do it. Like a little bit of that respect might be lingering. He doesn't want to lay. Lay Marcos Galvan out. He's only 45 seconds away from the title, but we'll see. Stranger things have happened. became the world champion. And you say, well, he's still evolving. He's still getting better. And tonight, at age 27, on his way to his second Bantamweight world title, he has been brilliant start to finish. Three years ago, the student defeated the master. Tonight, he became the master. Wiped him out from start to finish. This fight was not competitive at all. The replays could be at any point in this fight. Leg kick sharp, punches sharp, combination sharp, accurate. Power starting to take over in round number three. Dante's really starting to turn over the punches. You can see it on the face of Marcos Galvan. Like you said, a masterful performance. Respect, but not the emotion of no, three years ago. Definitely not. There's a distance there, you can see it. Three years ago, Eduardo Dantes did what he had to do. Tonight, he did whatever he wanted to do. Let's make it official with Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, having gone the distance in this world title fight, we'll go to your three cage side judges. Your first judge, Marcos Rosales, sees the fight 50 to 45. Judge Wade, Wade Vieira sees it 50 to 44. Your third and final judge, Mike Bray, scores it 50 to 43. All see it for the winner by unanimous decision of the new and now two-time Bellator Bantamweight World Champion, the new Eduardo Dantes. Our tale of the tape for this, our main event of the evening, is brought to you by Dave & Buster's, the only place to eat, drink, play, and watch sports. Talk about the age, only one year difference, but look at the experience. 20 and four for Eduardo Dantes, 10 and one for Darion Caldwell. Cannot wait for this title fight. Here is Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, live on Spike, Bellator MMA, presented by Miller Lite from Windstar World Casino and Resort. The time has come for the main event of the evening. Five five-minute rounds for the Bellator Bantamweight World Championship. Sanctioned by the Chickasaw Nation Office of the Gaming Commissioner, Mr. Scott Colbert. Tonight's world title fight is brought to you by Miller Lite, the original light beer. It's Miller time. And now, first introducing the blue corner. At five foot 10, weighing in 134.7 pounds, near perfect as a professional. He brings 10 wins, just one loss from Rawway, New Jersey. He fights out of San Diego, California, presenting the challenger, Darion the Wolf Caldwell. And across the cage, the champion tonight fights out of the red corner at five foot seven, weighing in 134.5 pounds as a professional. He brings 20 victories, four defeats, hailing from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, introducing the defending two-time Bellator Bantamweight World Champion, Dudu Eduardo. 
And when the bell rings, the referee in charge of the action, Jason Herzog. Jason Herzog, our referee for this main event. I'm just going over the rules in the back. There were no final questions from you, Blue. There were no final questions from you, Red. If you want to touch gloves, do it now. Come out ready to fight. I guess that was a glove touch. You know what? They <laughs> did. They did. Come on. It's the intent that matters. They I touched. know they touched, but I don't know if they had the intent. Dauntis. Caldwell. First round, buddy, you ready? Buddy, you ready? Fight! Here we go! Tonight's fight clock brought to you by Miller Lite, the original light beer. Cheers. It's Miller time. Blue gloves for the southpaw, Darian Caldwell. Red gloves for the champion, Eduardo Dantes. what Darion Caldwell has picked up in the realm of stand-up. We haven't seen much of his boxing, kickboxing. He generally throws wild strikes in order to get to the legs. They both connect early. The switch. Nice transition by Caldwell. Caldwell can be a little patient here. He's got his hands locked. He's winning this position. He doesn't have to think like a college wrestler. He's got to drag him down and get control. Right here is a win. With the judges, a few seconds, but a few seconds at a time, Jim, but they all add up. Knees to the back of the legs are an option. Picking him up, dragging him down. He was in a similar position with Joe Warren, sent him all the way over the top, Josh Barnett style. Five point throw, beautiful stuff. Looking for it, bones! Uh, like that, yep. right on just like that. Dantes trying to avoid it happening again. Again, the key here is that he's keeping his hands locked. Many guys hit that belly to back suplex, they let the opponent go. Caldwell just needs to stay attacked. One thing about Dantes, he has the jiu jitsu roll with something like that. Right down, gave up a rear naked. 109 collegiate wrestling wins, and he was hurt most of his senior season at NC State. National champion, two-time All-American, put the pressure on the champ early. No, no we expected this kind of fight. He's known as a fast starter. Yeah. He's known to be extremely aggressive. This is the kind of storm that Eduardo Dantes has to weather. Jimmy, you were talking about the fact that over the last 10 or 11 Bellator fights overall for everybody, this man may have fought the least amount of time, the least round. Yes, exactly. Very explosive, quick finishes in his last couple fights. Guys, Dante's options are very limited right now. The basic rule is fight the hands, which he's doing. Second step, drive your hips forward to make him block. However, when his hips come forward, his elevation goes up, and he gets suplexed. And he doesn't have the room to go forward. So he needs yep. to just be a little patient right here. Start to play the game. Eventually, I'd expect an elbow or two to fly back from Dantes. It won't do much damage, but it might change the position. Otherwise, he's going to have to be patient, and Caldwell is playing the same game. Not a lot of options for Caldwell. He doesn't have to take him down, knowing that his opponent's just going to spring back up. Save a little energy, put the crowd to sleep, maybe. Maybe we're going to hear some boos, but the judges are paying attention, and that are the three people that matter, Jimmy. And also, roll for an e-bar from here. Wouldn't surprise if he goes funky for something like that as well. Jadaron Caldwell, we don't want that right leg sneaking between the legs of Eduardo Dantes. Longest layoff of his career in anticipation of this fight, 307 days, but he's coming out very strong. This is the third time he has fought here in Thackerville. Fourth for Dantes. Herzog says, don't hold the fence. Nice move, but can't keep him down. So he's constantly touching the cage, he's constantly touching the pad, but not always grabbing. Dantes, first won the belt in 2012. Triangle. Arm triangle choke win against Zach Lukowski. They break. they break it. And let's see if Dantes can take advantage. Head kick for Caldwell, flying knee. That's what I mean about funky, wild techniques, and he just drops for a low single leg after. Really trying to catch that kick. Normally, opposite stances, you'd be late kicking like crazy, but he's hesitant to throw it after spending all that time in a waist cinch. Opens up that straight right against the southpaw, or opposite, as Caldwell looked for there. Dante's keeping his hands high. 
Oh, nice right, nice left over the top. Yep, on the way in, on the way out. Final 30 seconds of the first of a potential five, five minute rounds. Dantes trying to establish some leg kicks, no luck so far. One of the problems with facing this southpaw is the jab is just not as effective as it was against the orthodox Joe Warren. Uh, the highlight of that round, the suplex by the Wolf, the NC State National Wrestling Champ. Kareem Gaji for the welterweight title, the return of Stitch Em Up Joe Silling, and the soul assassin Kevin Ross. Bellator kickboxing after our main event. Mike Goldberg, Jimmy Smith, Chael Sonnen, Jen Brown, round two of our main event of the evening, and a good round one in this bantamweight title fight for the challenger Darian Caldwell. Hey, and Dantes knows it. He doesn't care if they're close rounds or not. If he's not coming out with the, the 10 points, he's got to come forward. And he's starting to do that now. And the one thing that Dantes is so good at is his range. It's a little hard to establish it for him in that first frame. Boy, that's a fast shot, Jimmy. Quick. I mean, my goodness, that is really unbelievable. a special level of speed. And here we go. Special level of athlete. Yep. I think he's walking over to his corner. Yeah, he sure is. He walked right over to his corner, but again, same position we've already seen. Now, when Caldwell is hitting that, he's looking to bring that left leg over and trip the right ankle of Dantas. He just keeps missing it by about five inches. You know, like I said in the breakdown, even if you found a national champion, okay, you found a guy who won a national title, I'm going to train with him. They don't wrestle like Darion Caldwell. Yeah. He had a funky style in the NCAAs. I mean, he had a funky style that other top-level wrestlers weren't ready for. So you might be able to find a guy with his credentials on paper, but not with his style. Freestyle wrestling brings him supreme confidence in dictating where this fight takes place. I like these seconds into the second. I like these head kicks too, by Caldwell. I think we should probably start giving him a little do for these because they are landing. He's a guy that's always kind of struggled knowing where his range is, getting much power on those. These are real head kicks. It's a credit to Dante's defense. He always keeps that right hand high, always keeps his chin low. Very sound defense. He's been able to block him. Yeah, he's got that right hand in the pocket ready to fire. But what he can't do is let Darion Caldwell get away with things like that flying knee, these big, wild techniques. He has to make him pay for reaching for him like that with more of those right hands. And we've seen over time, Jimmy, that when Dantes has success, there's the head kick again, Chael. It's because he's putting his combinations together. And he's generally not a one-and-done kind of striker. Yeah. He needs three and four to put you away. That's what he has to start throwing. Nice duck under by Caldwell. Loves Alliance MMA. Dominic Cruz talked a lot about training with Jeremy Stevens, one of the toughest dudes out there. Heavy hands. Justin Lawrence as well. Okay, so many questions that come in. Dante's heavy favorite in this fight, largely because people don't think Caldwell can hold up. I will tell you, he can hold this pace, and I will not make believe to our audience that this is the most exciting fight, but I won't make believe to you guys that this isn't smart, right. and the minutes are ticking down. Back to the body kick over and over. Nice leg kick in the turn. Is that head kick you were talking about? Caldwell mixing things up very nicely thus far. But in this second round, Dante starting to control the real estate, starting to push forward, starting to be the aggressor. He needs to land to me something of substance to win back this round, and it's another takedown. He needed that. Even if for a moment, Jimmy, there's a very close yeah. round. You felt that momentum swing of Dante starting to push him back. Boy, that's great. Oh, oh he, he dropped shot. it. He heard him. Legitimate knockdown. Dantes, yeah, good recovery. Trying to get it back to the feet, and he does. But that shot, that hurt. shot hurt. Yeah. Look at Dante's marching forward. That's one thing we have never seen. We've seen Dante's out hustled, out wrestled, but in the Bellator cage, we haven't seen him really hurt. We haven't seen him really rocked. That shot hurt him. Make no mistake. 
and it comes right after Chael and Jimmy saying that it looked like Dantas was getting more comfortable and it was a strong elbow that connected from Coldwell. And Dantes marching forward. Nice like, uppercut right through the guard. This is why Dantes is the champion. This is how champions fight. Good takedown defense there. And sprawl and brawl. Oh, he got him. What's he starting to do? He's starting to make Darion Caldwell work for the takedown. It's not going to be there every time you want it. That spinning back fist connected. So did Caldwell's one, two. Yes, indeed. Final seconds of round two. So far, so good in this bantamweight championship fight. Right here, live on Spike. And look at the elbow. Bang, right on the chin. Eduardo Dantes rocked by that shot. I'm telling you, that would have Brown, dropped a lot right? of bantamweights. He got up and kept fighting, but I thought it won Darion Caldwell the round. So is he up 2-0? Up 2-0, both 10-9. Jimmy scorecard, jail, 10-9, 10-9. I'm sure you agree. I co-signed that. There's a little uh, signature underneath my scorecard, and I slide it over to Chael and he signs it. That's the way it works behind the scenes. Here. I, I'm kind of afraid to ask Chael if he always agrees, though, because I'm We can do this right now, bro. I fear nobody. <laughs> okay, Chael? All right. Oh, Dantes. He has the right to be wrong, just like everybody else. Okay? <laughs> Both these guys are making the other one wonder, and yeah, I know yeah. that that's true because I'm wondering. Yeah. They're confusing me from the outside. I don't know what they're going to do. Dantes spins this way. Caldwell coming with high kicks, falls up with a one-two, singles lightning fast. You talk about a feeling out process. We are way past that in theory, but these guys don't know what to expect still. Because they have so many weapons, you never know which one they're going to come at you with. Can he stop it again? He's gonna angle off that fence. Darion Caldwell has done such a good job of killing time on the fence. How he's won the first two rounds. Caldwell keeps his head position. Yeah. Pushing Dantes' jaw away, turning his head. He can hold this a little longer. Dantes knows that, pulls him off. Caldwell goes to the other side. He's got his Crossing. hands locked. It's up nice and high on the hip. Be a lot easier for Caldwell if he had both legs. Singles are very tough in MMA. Yeah. Great stuff by Dantes. Yes. Yeah. Spinning around, trying spin to take around. the back to net time. Takedowns aren't coming anymore. Big kick, swing and a miss. And they scramble once again. Oh, he held the fence. Bobo drug him down, though. Looking for the switch. What he got on Zach Makovsky. Darren Caldwell not going for it. Excellent wrist control this time. Good pressure by Darren Caldwell. Just tenacious with the takedown. What this does, it stifles the offense of Eduardo Dantes. Yeah. He's stuck dealing with this takedown, trying to get space and not able to get his game going, which is essentially an outside game. And Jimmy, this is the pressure I was talking about before this fight, and I realize he's not getting the takedown he's looking for, but he is pressure. The physical pressure is right. still there, that, no doubt. Low single leg, back to the, back to the regular single. All kinds of pressure to your point, Chad. Caldwell again with the head position. As long as he maintains that head position, he'll hold this spot. Head fighting, something probably not talked enough about in MMA. Yeah, that's right. If the opponent can't have his head and his neck, if he can't look where he wants to, it's hard to control the rest of his body. Right here, Caldwell putting the top of his head right on his opponent's jaw, turning his body away. It's just enough to really weaken the strength and the power of Dantes. First thing Dantes did before he got out of that position is he got control of his head back. Oh! That was a heavy kick to the ribs. He's coming as a bit of a surprise. New weapon. Confident that is for certain. He's got to throw more than one if he's going to catch Caldwell, who is very confident with the striking at the moment. He uses it to set up his takedown. He becomes a distraction. The champ's pushing the pace here. He knows he's got some yeah. catching up to do. Slipping away. Spins. Looks like almost rolling for a leg lock there, but 
Dante's beautiful positioning with his left leg won't let it get in between his legs. Spent a few weeks with Craig Jones, he'd be finishing that. Yeah. This is not where Darion Caldwell wants to be. On the bottom against Eduardo Dantes, Novignon Black Belt. From Andre Pedineris back in 2011. Jimmy, are we seeing Caldwell starting to fade? I think we are. End of round three. Never been past round three, but positionally, last thing he wants is to play guard against Dantes. And Jimmy, we saw the gas tank emptied out in that submission loss to Joe T. Exactly. And even in the rematch, which he won, he was vulnerable at the end of every round. Yeah. He almost gave up front chokes. Good job getting a side control. And he was dominant against Joe T for the first two rounds of that fight. Final 15 seconds, then we will hit the championship rounds. Good change of momentum for the champion. The problem is, I don't think it was in time to swing the round. That's the difference. Sit down. Sit down. Breathe. 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 Dominic Cruz, Eric Del Fierro. Hey, sit up straight. Sit up straight. Breathe through your mouth, not your nose. Breathe through your mouth, not your nose. Listen. No, we lost that round. Breathe okay. through your mouth, you not your top, nose. We lost that round. Look, I need left hand and left kick. Breathe through your mouth. Left hand and left kick. Okay. Dantes looking round very, very we tired. Got two in the back, we lost one. It's you. You just got to hustle for it. Okay? Don't waste too much time on the legs if it's not there. Keep Caldwell. Keep well, it, his nose might be broken only because, you know, Eric said, hey, breathe out your mouth, not your nose. Exactly. You don't want to clear your nose, then boom, the eyes blow up. No, 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 get up, get up, get up, get up. Championship rounds for the first time in Darian Caldwell's career. On a round, buddy, ready. Dantes has successfully gone five rounds on more than one occasion in the Bellator cage. You just get the sensation that the, the sand is kind of running out of the, out of the hourglass for Darion Caldwell. A lot of that explosiveness starting to fade. Now, very close third round. I, I barely gave it to Caldwell. I thought he controlled more of the round. Dantes controlling the last minute. But man, that was a close round. Very, very close. And as this fight progresses, if it does go the distance, that may be the determining factor sure. if Dantes can get these next two, Jim. Yep, could all come down to that third round. Both fighters want to avoid the judges' scorecards. Dantes wants to bring the belt back home to real De Janeiro and his new bride, Patricia. Trying to fight off the takedown, yeah. not that time. Will be get a hook in. Although they didn't even try. Well, one thing Darren Cole's been hesitant to do is go to a jiu-jitsu game. Hooks in, he doesn't want to play Dantes' game. Dantes has been in this his whole life. He doesn't want to play jiu-jitsu. He, he wants to make it a wrestling match. And he stayed with traditional wrestling rides. He doesn't want to put the hooks in. He doesn't want to go for any chokes. I like how Dantes is bringing his elbow in to put pressure on this lock. Really make Caldwell's hands tire out. Right now, Caldwell's just hanging on, which is smart. But it's all he's doing. He needs to not stay on his knees again in wrestling MMA. Who's ever head is higher is winning around and around they go. Wow, that scramble. Get some drama mean people. A beautiful stuff by Eduardo Dantes. Oh, uh, welcome to where you don't want to be. Amen. Three minutes left in the round. Body triangle tail on the good side. You know, Goldie, I could tell our audience technically how you're supposed to get out of a body triangle, but it doesn't work. <laughs> you're stuck. You're just yeah. lying to him. The one disadvantage of the body triangle makes it a little bit high when going for a rear naked choke. Hard to stretch your opponent out. Eduardo trying to lock in that body triangle again. But going rear naked. Try Got a neck crank. crank. Now, that was beautiful. What that was is a crank just to get Caldwell's hands up, and then he locks the body triangle in. One hook in, distract him. Didn't, he knew he wasn't going to get a tap with that, but it brings the hands up, then he gets the body triangle. Connecting the dots towards a potential finish. Playing chess, not checkers. 
Dantes is just being vicious here, but all he's really looking to do, Jimmy, to your point, is stay on top, and that's where the sweat comes in. That wasn't even a technique as much as it was Caldwell just moving. Had his arm on the right side, trapping Dantes, and just used that sweat, body on body, and rotated on top. Closed guard now for the champion. Caldwell trying to land these elbows. It looks like he caught him with one of them. It's a fresh cut over the left eye. Yep. Razor sharp elbows from the wolf. Yeah, wasn't a big shot. Corner complaining about the fence grabs from the champ Eduardo Dantes. Caldwell needs to just stick with that when he can. Going to Kimura, trying to isolate the right arm of Darion Caldwell. Yeah, Caldwell's gonna need to rotate his, his weight or step over the leg. Right now he should be safe. But if he can go back to those elbows, they add up fast. Good pressure from Caldwell as he gets out of a bad situation. Here in round number four. Right in front of his corner, Dominic Cruz. You can see him in the background. Right now, I think this round is up for grabs with one minute left. They both had their advantages. Dantes took the back, then Caldwell on top and cut him with an elbow. Whoever, I think, finishes strong in this last minute wins the round of my scorecard. Caldwell needs to get off those knees. Just no quit so far in Darion Caldwell. This position, gentlemen, to remind you of the first round, of the second round, of the third round, this position has been the biggest position of the entire fight. Going hard for the Kimura. Really cranking on it, but Caldwell lose, using the fence to stay tight. That's what's preventing him from engaging his hips and rolling with this position. And one of those little things, Chael, what a benefit when you're in this type of battle to have your cornerman right there. Caldwell's listening too. He's either yeah. even, re even responded to Coach Del Fierro <laughs> or he's talking trash to Dantes. I'm not sure which it is, but he has talked a little bit. Maybe both. Maybe both. We're going to say combination of both. Final seconds of the fourth. Couple of great scrambles, Jail. Yeah, round and around they go. Yeah. Caldwell wasn't great about gaining elevation. When he got on top here, though, he started dropping these Tito Ortiz style elbows, just one after the next. Not Boom. looking, not planning, just bending that arm and dropping them on your opponent's head. Jimmy, that's the one that cut him. Yep. Boom. Yep. Right there. Right over the top. Yep. And I see a desperation round in round five for Eduardo Dantes as he wants to walk away with the title. Five minutes remain in our main event. The champion in red, the challenger in blue. Dantes looking for the second title defense of this, his second world title. He's got some catching up to do, Jimmy. Yeah, I think Dantes needs a finish. I've given Caldwell every round. Third very close, four was close. I thought Caldwell just finished a little bit stronger, controlled more of the round. If you're Dantes, you want a finish. You want domination in this fifth round. And he knows it. Yep. Ten and one is a pro, seven and one in Bellator. So most of his professional career has been under some pretty big lights. Guys, what has to be very frustrating for Dantes is largely his plan has worked tonight. Keep the distance. Don't get taken down. Stay up against the fence. Don't stay in the center of the mat. However, he isn't be able to find his own attack. He's almost got a little bit too much distance, Jimmy. Yep. Yes, he's done a great job at defending the takedown. Sure he has. But he isn't landing those kicks, those strikes. He isn't touching his opponent. Exactly. And scoring the points he needs to. The close rounds, the only reason I Oh! Good knee. I heard that. Yeah, we, we all heard it. That was a crack. From the flying knee of Darian Caldwell.
Caldwell's been able to kill a lot of time with the waist, a lot of pressure against the fence. Not always clean with the takeout, not always getting it, but always putting pressure on Eduardo Dantas. See, situations like that, he lost his footing for a second up against the fence. He cannot let Darion Caldwell off the hook, and he did. Big left hand slipped through for Caldwell. Clock becoming very unkind to the champion. Dantas really not fighting with that sense of urgency in this fifth round. He's walking forward, but hasn't really thrown anything. 2009 National Wrestling Champion at NC State, trying to become the Bellator World Champion here in 2017. It's almost like he's waiting for Darren Caldwell to initiate so he can counter, but Caldwell's ahead. He has no motivation, in my opinion, to initiate. He's and content I'm, to wait. I'm not seeing a fading Caldwell here. I did think he was letting off the gas a little in the third round. I got no problem with the fourth, and possibly he looks his best right here in the fifth. And Dantas isn't forcing him to do much, too. No, he's not testing that gas tank. Really get something done here. Great wrestling lineage. What happened? Accidental poke in the eye, I believe. Yeah, the rest they didn't see it. That's didn't right. happen. That's exactly right. Boom! Oh, spinning back fist. Follow needs to keep that ankle and pull him off the fence. He's got to pull him off the fence here. Dantas has to roll for something crazy. With his back in round three, that was his best moment of this fight. And look what position we end up in. Yep, yep. Could be Suplex City again. Although they're pretty sweaty. Under 90 seconds on the clock. Fifth and final round. Caldwell didn't have to do that. He yeah. sat to this position. He did not have to do that. He missed the trip. Dantes is hooking the leg. Might be thinking leg lock. Caldwell needs one more big scramble in him, and it's going to be coming out of this position. He's going to wait until Dantes moves. He doesn't have to move until Dantes does, but once he goes, Caldwell has got to match it. And look for Dantes to spin for a leg, to spin for something, try to take the back. Doesn't get it. Under a minute. by the champ, whose belt is in jeopardy big time right now. I guess he wasn't lying, Jimmy, when Darren Caldwell said the timing is perfect. Yep. Fought a great fight. Fought a smart fight. And a consistent pace. Yes. Fifteen seconds. Champ has to go crazy. Has to get this rear naked. I don't think he has time. Nope. Not enough time to turn it around. They go the distance. Watch oh. this put a light punch in after the bell there. Darian Caldwell. Spectacular performance. Take a look at our Blackheart Premium Spice Drum Replay. The bold 93 proof rum that's edgy to the core. I'll let the wrestler take the wrestling of Darion Caldwell. That was the story of the fight. Yeah, listen, he was getting his hands locked there. Then he was hitting him with surprises like this. This was on a scramble. He was starting to surprise it, keeping him guessing there. Another trip, came to the side, kept those hands locked. Found a way, and largely because of the sweat. But he got on top, he started dropping those Ortiz-style elbows on him. And then this kick, you know, don't forget about this. Caldwell started surprising us with that rear kick. He usually went high in the fight. He did drop a couple of the body. We saw that one go to the leg. Look, I can tell the fans that the camera isn't picking up on this. I'm live in the arena. I'm looking at the corners right now. Darian Caldwell believes he won the fight. Dantes does not. The official decision is in. Here is Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, having gone the distance, we'll go to your three judges at cage side. Your first judge, Michael Bell, scores the fight 48-47. Judge David Sutherland also sees the fight 48-47. Your third and final judge, Todd Anderson, scores the fight 50-45. All have it.
for the winner by unanimous decision. And now the new Bellator Bantamweight World Champion, Darion Hall-Baldwin. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to Bellator MMA Live on DAZN. Tonight, from Madison Square Garden, the world's most famous arena, we begin with five five-minute rounds for the Bellator Bantamweight World Championship. Sanctioned by the New York State Athletic Commission Executive Director Kim Sumbler. And now, fighting first out of the blue corner at 5 foot 5, weighing in 134.4 pounds in his Bellator debut, the Ryzen Bantamweight Champion brings a professional record of 27 wins, just two losses from Takasaki Guma, Japan. Introducing the challenger, Kiyoshi Horaguchi. And across the cage, the champion tonight fights out of the red corner at 5 foot 10, weighing in 134.6 pounds. In his second title defense, he stands with 13 professional victories, two defeats. Fighting out of San Diego, California, he hails from Rahway, New Jersey, presenting the defending Bellator Bantamweight World Champion, Daria Hawaii. the referee in charge of the action, Todd Anderson. Gentlemen, remove the rules in the back. Protect yourself at all times. Obey my commands at all times. If you wish to touch gloves, do so now. Step back. Referee is Todd Anderson. We're about to embark on the first of a possible five five-minute rounds for the Bellator Bantamweight title, Ryzen Bantamweight champion. Kyoji Uraguchi drew first blood against Darion hey. Caldwell. Hey. Hey. The bell and round one. Caldwell in the red gloves, Horiguchi in the blue gloves. Aside from the obvious, the biggest difference, fighting in a cage from a ring. Well, it is, but Horiguchi What is, is the biggest difference? Well, the biggest difference is, look at when you're in that ring, there's resets. There's the use of the ropes and getting yourself away from your opponent where you can't do that in the cage. There's all kinds of things that Horiguchi had the skill level of utilizing that Darian just didn't understand. This is more Darian's world, but it's also Horaguchi's world, and he will tell you he would rather fight MMA in a cage than he would in a ring. Caldwell became Bellator Bantamweight champion in October of 2017, defeating Eduardo Dantes at Bellator 184, and Caldwell utilizing his wrestling only, looking for the takedown on Horaguchi, and has his back. Caldwell, the bigger of the two champions. By far the bigger man, but you know, when you look at that, there's advantages and disadvantages. That was a huge elbow, and that's what we were talking about, the difference for Darion Caldwell. He utilizes big elbows, and he thinks it's going to be a big difference in this fight. The question is, does he lose too much weight? Is he going to start to get tired? Because the longer the fight goes, the more I think it goes towards Kiyoji Horiguchi. Six of Caldwell's seven victories by KO submission have come in the opening round, and he's immediately on top of Horiguchi. How is Horiguchi off his back, John? He's very good off of his back. He's got a very effective guard. You can see right now, even with his positioning, he's keeping Darian at a position where he's off center keeping his back against the cage and utilizing the cage to get back to his feet. Horiguchi, 27 and two, 14 knockouts, three submission victories. Caldwell, 13 and two with two knockouts and five subs. So a huge edge in experience you can for Horiguchi. Darian has laced that arm behind the back and that's why he's opening up with those big right elbows. Look at him, you can see he's got Horiguchi's left arm trapped behind his back. Caldwell began wrestling at the age of nine, was a three-time New Jersey State wrestling champion. He wrestled D1 in college for North Carolina State and was the 2009 NCAA Division I national champion. A big difference in the opening two and a half minutes of this fight compared to their first fight, and it's all due to those elbow strikes. 
Oraguchi has nine victories via first round knockout or submission. Started karate at five years of age as a Shotokan karate black belt. At the age of 16, saw Pride Fighting Championships event and became addicted to mixed martial arts. Trained under his hero, the late great Norafumi Kid Yamamoto. Made his pro debut in May of 2010, under two minutes left. And Caldwell keeping Oraguchi pinned to the mat. Keeping him pinned there, but he's he's accepting a position of cl clasping his hands behind Horaguchi's back while Horaguchi lands these shots. That's not smart by Darian. He needs to think about I can pull his hits out and attack. I've got to pass that guard. Coming up on the final 90 seconds of our opening round. Caldwell utilizing his wrestling early to take down Horaguchi, but is unable to maximize this position. And you're right, Horaguchi's the one who's imposing the offense with those strikes as Caldwell remains in a position. And what do you think Caldwell's attempting to do here, John? He's attempting to control the position and put Horaguchi where he wants. Oh, there's a, the attempt, another stretch. one that landed for Caldwell. Good, 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 good. The, the big difference in this round, Horaguchi is landing these little strikes, good, good. but they're doing no damage. But you're looking at the strikes that Caldwell is landing. They have been big, heavy strikes. Under a minute left in the first frame. Half guard being employed by Horaguchi. Caldwell I'm looking, keep looking again to try to find an opening, try to Grab find a, a way to... Stop! Stop. Yeah. Stop. Stop! Referee is... We have What we have is Horaguchi is holding on to Caldwell's glove. Your fingers are in the glove. Or, yes, I excuse me, Caldwell's holding on to Horaguchi's glove. You understand? In the... Ready, ready, turn, fight! And that's why he's out of the position. He was holding on to Horaguchi's glove. Horaguchi was trying to tell the referee Todd Anderson sees it. And that's why he breaks him and sets her, starts him on the feet. Fifteen seconds left in the first round, and Caldwell and Horaguchi renewing hostilities here in Bellator MMA. And hey, hey, hey! Bell, this is round number two. Two great camps being represented in this championship fight. Caldwell. Fighting on a team alliance, head trainer Eric Del Fierro. And while Horaguchi makes his home in Japan, he trains with American top team in Coconut Creek, Florida, as head trainer, former WEC champion Mike Brown. You know, an outstanding fighter in his day. He was the first guy to really, he took the crown from Uriah Faber. But what a trainer he has become. Mike Brown is phenomenal as a trainer and says that Kyoji Horiguchi is the hardest training guy he has ever seen. And what about what Eric Del Fierro has been able to accomplish at Team Alliance? Well, I'll tell you what, Eric Del Fierro, with the help of Dominic Cruz, has created a super camp down in San Diego where those guys are just a bunch of killers. South Park called well, fishing for a, a head kick. Horiguchi darting in and out of range. Then Caldwell, 5'10", Horaguchi, 5'5". Five, five. There's a head kick, but partially blocked by Horaguchi. And you see Horaguchi pressing the issue. He's not backing away. He's looking for that opportunity to get inside to land those shots, because he has to get past that range of Darium. We invite you to become a part of the conversation on social media. Hashtag Bellator222. What a way to kick things off with this. Bellator Bantamweight Championship fight. Caldwell looking not only to defend the title, but even the series with Horaguchi. And he has it's already mentioned, when he wins tonight, he'll go to Japan and then vie for the Ryzen Bantamweight title, and they could complete their trilogy. So obviously confidence oozing out of both fighters heading into this rematch as Caldwell shoots the single. Nice clean shot. Runs it down, but you look and see and look at exactly what Horgridge did. He got himself all the way to the cage where he could get his back against it to get himself back up. We saw this in the opening round. You talked a little bit about what Caldwell could do looking at it from this position. He wasn't able to, to improve his position. How can he do so here? Well, he did improve his position eventually. He got to that half guard position. 
which is an improvement from being where he's got you know, basically a guard position here. But he's doing, he's just sitting there again on top, exactly. putting his weight on what he needs to do. I need to stop being just the wrestler at this moment and trying to pull my opponent's hips away from the cage and get him down on his back because it hasn't worked. So let me break free and strike and land big shots. They're going to damage and break my opponent down. Every fighter's mental makeup is different, but we've seen it even on the undercard. Caldwell coming off a, a big loss in Japan. Does that speak to maybe being a little more conservative, sticking to his bread and butter early, just imposing his will and skill and just making sure that he executes his game plan at any 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 step? Absolutely. Look at no doubt look, when you lose a fight, you gotta go back and say, okay, where did I make, make my mistakes? And he made a lot in that first fight. And a, and a big part of it was his, oh, wow. well, his inability to keep Horiguchi on the ground. And that's what he's trying to change right here. And now, Caldwell again, and Horiguchi against the fence, but Horiguchi dropping those left hands. Minute and a half left in the second round. Darian needs to stop just grabbing the waist. If he's gonna grab and put his hands and get that gable grip, then he needs to start to lift back, bringing Horiguchi's hips off of the cage and start to put him flat on his back. Caldwell talking to us about what ex-UFC champion Dominic Cruz has, has meant to him, and especially when you, you look at angles and footwork, I mean, <laughs> Cruz changed the game. Oh, no doubt about it. You, you can see a lot of times, Darian, when he's very confident, he starts to bring a footwork out that, that mimics Dominic Cruz very much. And you'll notice tonight, he doesn't do that. He doesn't do that because he's always unsure of where Horiguchi is going to come from. See, right now, this is the difference of Horiguchi is actually fighting. Darian Caldwell is trying to control. And the fight should always be won by the guy trying to fight, not the guy trying to control. Yeah, the referee brings them back up to their feet. Caldwell telling us that the rematch would go one way, him taking down Horiguchi and punishing them. He's taken Horiguchi down. He hasn't really punished him yet. No, he, well, he did in the first round with some big shots. But in this second round, he has done nothing to diminish Horiguchi. And Horiguchi is the guy landing the strikes. Well, round number three, talk about the adjustments that Horiguchi has to make as we look at your unofficial scorecard, John. Talk about it through two rounds. Well, there's no doubt in my mind, Caldwell won that first round, landed the bigger shots. But in the second round, he didn't land any big shots. In fact, he just wrestled, he got position, but he was accepting small strikes. And look at when you did nothing with your submission game, nothing to do anything to finish the fight against Horiguchi, he wins the round. Talk about potential adjustments for each fighter as Horiguchi goes to the air with that knee strike. Now the small north side position. Horiguchi looking for the guillotine again, just like in Japan. What, what Darian needs to do right now is control that hand, take his time. In my opinion, he's the guy that can win all the scrambles when it comes to the wrestling game. He can take chances. But the problem is, and this is what I was talking about at the beginning of the fight, I think Darian's starting to get tired. It is that weight cut. That he is losing so much weight in that weight cut that he's losing his ability to maintain that energy oh. to keep the pace. Looking for that elevator sweep with the butterfly hooks. Caldwell, who is on the bottom now. Horiguchi looking to pass guard. And Horiguchi has the three submission wins. A rear naked choke, an arm triangle, and the guillotine choke victory against Caldwell. Now in half guard, open half guard, could try to slip to side control, but now electing to just put the pressure on Caldwell. And you're seeing Horiguchi, what he's trying to do is he's trying to create pressure with his hips to free his leg to get himself out of the half guard, more to a side control position. But at least he's starting to open up and starting to utilize some strikes. That's what you want to see from the guy on top. Caldwell telling us that he expected Horiguchi to be stronger, faster, and more confident in this, the rematch, but he told us that he's going to shut his body off. He knows it's the biggest fight of his career. His belt is on the line. And actually, 
Caldwell's last fight here in Bellator took place at featherweight, to your point, John. Potentially moving up. He stopped Noel Lahat via second round TKO. He is 7-0 oh at 145. Well, I want you to think about it more. Back in 2009, when he won the NCAA championships, he won that at 149 pounds. He is fighting at 135 now. That's a huge drop in weight. Midway point of the round and the fight. With Horaguchi in top position, the open guard of Caldwell. And this is the difference of what you're seeing is when Horaguchi was put on his back by Caldwell, he gets himself to the cage and he does not accept the position. He continues to work his way out of it. And you're not seeing that from Caldwell. And Horaguchi and Caldwell back on the feet. The southpaw swings wildly. It was fouled by Horaguchi. And immediately Horaguchi back right in the half butterfly guard of Caldwell. I'm sorry, that right there just tells you Darren Caldwell is tired. He was on his knees, able to come up. He did not, he just fell to his back. He's not a jiu-jitsu guy off of his back. This is not the area where he wins fights. Second rematch in Caldwell's career. Lost to Joe Tamanglo, and was able to avenge that loss. And here tonight, looking to avenge the setback in the land of the rising sun with 90 seconds left here in round three. And series of punches by Horaguchi, showing the referee that he's staying busy. Nice job by Horaguchi trying to get Joe back. And those left hands delivered by Horaguchi. Caldwell back up to his feet. A knee on the exit. And a free kick from Caldwell. A minute left in the third round. Another knee. Left and now they're exchanging punches. Left uppercut. Sprawl by Horaguchi. But will Caldwell be able to persevere? It's Horaguchi here in preventing his offense. Well, right now, Caldwell's in a good position to put him flat on his back. And he got the fence. Now posture and start laying down damaging strikes. But there goes Gorkucci again. By Not accepting the position, Moral. Caldwell with five submission wins, three guillotine chokes, two rear naked chokes. And now under 30 seconds left, Horaguchi with his back against the fence in a seated position. And you know expending a lot of energy, both of them. With Caldwell imposing his will on top and Horaguchi trying to keep the bigger man off him or at least trying to stymie his offensive attempts. We are through three rounds in this rematch for the Bellator Bantamweight title. Back up, back up. Ready, ready to fight. This is round number four of a possible five. Bantamweight champion Darian Caldwell defending his Bellator belt against rising champion Kyoji Horaguchi. John, after three rounds, how do you look? Here's Horaguchi again, fishing for that choke. Fishing for it, but he does not have it right at this moment, but it's getting tight. Will it be deja vu all over again for Darian Caldwell? And he pops his head out. Your unofficial scorecard after three rounds, how does it read and why? Officially, I have Horaguchi ahead, two rounds to one right now. 10-9 on each round. The reason why is, look at he's the guy who's trying to end the fight. There was that nice moment at the end, the third round, with Caldwell, but it wasn't enough to overcome all the minutes that he let run by. We saw Caldwell receiving instructions from both Eric Del Fierro and Dominic Cruz. I have had opportunities to interview Cruz on myriad occasions over the years when he was the champion, and I always thought to myself, this guy's going to make an excellent coach and an excellent analyst, and he's gone on to, to prove me right on both counts. Both counts. And, the, and one of the things that you saw Dominic doing in his corner was he was he was trying to psychologically tell Caldwell, you're not tired, you're not tired. Tell yourself you're not tired. And that's important because right now, Darian Caldwell is saying, oh. tired. Caldwell just trying to keep Horaguchi. Horaguchi throwing some left hands, continues to pepper the side of Caldwell's head. Yeah, definitely it's doing no damage no. to Caldwell, but it is, it's adding up. It's just a volume. And when you look at there's nothing else that comes up in the striking area, the judge is going to go, well, 
there you go. He landed all those shots, even though they weren't real hard. They landed. By the way, with a win by submission, Caldwell would be tied at first for most submissions with six. Joining Goichi Yamuchi, Watson Held, Michael Chandler, Alima Le McFarlane, who's joining us at the fight desk, and Neiman Gracie, who will challenge Roy McDonald for the Bellator Welterweight Championship in the main event in the semifinals of the Welterweight World Grand Prix. And, well, the fight is receiving Bronx cheers, Mr. McCarthy. Well, there was a really slick elbow that Caldwell just hit Horiguchi with, but Caldwell's making a huge mistake in making this a wrestling match and thinking he can win this fight by just out controlling his opponent. That's going to get him a big L. And again, Gorguchi feeding steady stream. You're right, just peppering them. No damage whatsoever, but the accumulation, and he's the one who's busy. Yeah, because you look at what is Dar Darian doing right now is he's wrestling. He's spending energy. He's on top, but he's not doing anything towards working towards the submission, working towards doing damaging strikes. Right now, all the judges are seeing a guy is sitting there getting hit. It's not effective energy in, in a way. I mean, so what is position. what Let's is the it. plan here? That what's what should he be doing in Caldwell oh, in it, this it, position? Look at him. My my opinion, his corner should have been telling him if you put him against the cage and his back goes up there, unlock your hands and just start to unload on him. If he gets up in the position, no problem. Agree with the stand up. Absolutely. Should he have done it sooner? Yes, he should have. Right hand connects for Horaguchi. Kick by Caldwell blocked. And this right now, when you have a guy like Horaguchi who's very fast and elusive, and you're tired and you have to move, this is where you start to go into that deficit if you're Caldwell. First kick to the chest by Caldwell. Look at the spinning move. Kick by Horaguchi just glancing off the rib cage of Caldwell. Final minute of the fourth. You see in the movement, Caldwell is starting oh. just to dive with that right there. And you know, Gucci avoids it. Horiguchi's your fighter that's coming forward. He's looking to do things in the fight to finish the fight. But right now, I'm looking at Caldwell, looking at Sam. He doesn't look like he's happy where he's at. Took a big shot right there. Gucci riding a wave of momentum with 12 consecutive victories coming into his Bellator MMA debut. Turning the tables on Caldwell, looking to change levels. Thwarted by Caldwell. Final 10 seconds of the penultimate round. We are headed to the fifth and final round of this Bellator Bantamweight Championship bout. Ready, fight! 29-year-old Kyoji Horaguchi in his 30th professional fight against the 31-year-old Bellator Panamweight champion Darion the Wolf Caldwell in his 16th pro bout. And round five, where you have to pull out all the stops, right, Big John? No doubt about it. Look at your title is on the line, and if you think that you've got this, you could definitely be wrong. You need to go for that finish. All right now, I have Horaguchi winning this round, and I have it to where Darian Caldwell needs to finish Horaguchi or have a big round to get it back. Horaguchi leading with the left, and Caldwell again. And we have seen this movie a few times tonight. Well, the one thing is Caldwell is in his corner, so if you're in his corner, you need to be telling him, let go with your hands and start blasting it. And the audience at MSG doesn't like reruns. <laughs> you cannot sit here trying to hold on to his legs and think that you're going to win this fight by being the guy that's sitting on top. This is not a good position for Darion. He needs to open up to do damage. There's always the conversation about the scoring of takedowns and how they should be scored. John, elucidate a little bit on that. Well, you can look at that takedown. That really wasn't a takedown. It was a, an actual takedown by Horiguchi that ended up in a scramble that he overshot, and Darian gets position. 
but Caldwell from this position, when you have a takedown that is just almost a given, the judge is going to wait and see what you do with that position, and if you do nothing offensive with it, he's not going to give you much credit Aragushi for it. tattooing the, the rib cage with those right hands. Both of Caldwell's losses have come via guillotine choke and Horiguchi maneuvering for another attempt. And right now, if you're looking at it, Morrow, would you say that a takedown in this position for Darian is doing him good no. or doing him bad? It's static. Bingo. So it's not working to your advantage to get that takedown and just keep yourself hey, in this up. position. Horiguchi trying to cinch that guillotine choke in. And again, he's searching for a submission. What is he trying to do? He's trying to finish the fight. Yes, incremental position, trying hand grappling now. Still plenty of time left in the round. Over two minutes left in this championship fight. Dominic Cruz imploring Caldwell to elevate his legs under your chest. And he didn't do it. Now his chin's in a bad position with Horiguchi. Please be careful. Don't allow your chin to stick down. Keep your head that up, press against it. The coaches are giving him the right advice. He's not listening. Exactly. And that's, you know, sometimes when you are in that position, do you listen to coaches? Are you, are you able to take that information and put it into action? And right now we're seeing that Caldwell is not able to do that. They're talking transitions, John. Well, they're also talking an arm triangle. They're talking a lot of things, but all of them are something that does something to try to end the fight. That's and what he did. Looking to get back to his feet. A knee from Caldwell. Again, looking for the takedown. Secures it. But will he try to improve position? Will he try to finish? Horaguchi with less than a minute left. It's Horaguchi again implementing the offensive strikes. You see Darian burying his head under the leg to try to keep that from happening. And that could result in, in a triangle. potential trouble. Darian is. So close to being put into a triangle right now. Now there's nothing. Final 30 seconds of our opening contest here at Bellator 222. A cut under the right eye of Horaguchi, trickling blood. That was from that one hour that he brought up. And it did damage. Yeah, and that's what we're looking for. So after their first meeting at the Saitama Super Arena New Year's Eve in Japan, they go the distance in the rematch for the Bellator Bantamweight title, much to the chagrin of the audience at MSG. Look at the elbows landed by Kyoji Horiguchi. That's a solid shot right to the side of Darion Caldwell's head. And you see that he gets affected by it and actually tucks his head up in a position where Horiguchi had the opportunity to get an inverted triangle here. He just wasn't able to do it. Here's Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, having gone the distance in this world title fight will go to your judges' scorecards. Your first judge, David Torelli, scores the fight 48 to 47. While judges Derek Cleary and Douglas Crosby both see the fight the same, 49 to 46. I'll have it for the winner by unanimous decision. And now the new Bellator Bantamweight World Champion, Hiroshi Haruchi. Ladies and gentlemen, Bellator MMA live on Paramount Network from Mohegan Sun Arena, the time has come for the main event of the evening. Five five minute rounds for the vacant Bellator Bantamweight World Championship. Sanctioned by the Mohegan Tribe Department of Athletic Regulation Chairman James Gessner, President of Sports and Entertainment Mr. Tom Cantone, Supervising at Cade Side Brendan Kaliwa, and Director Mike Mazzulli. And now, first, introducing the Blue Corner. 
at 5 foot 11, weighing in 135 pounds even in his first Bellator World title fight. He enters as an undefeated professional, 13 victories with no defeats. By way of Albuquerque, New Mexico, he fights out of Angola, New oh York, God! presenting oh Patchy No Love Mix. And across the cage, his adversary fighting out of the red corner at five foot seven, weighing in 134.6 pounds. After his recent featherweight world title challenge, he's back at bantamweight and stands with 24 professional victories, just two losses. Fighting out of Hesperia, California, introducing Juan the Spaniard Archuleta. In charge of the action, your referee, Jason Herzog. Fighters gone over the rules in the back. There were no final questions from you, Blue. There were no final questions from you, Red. If you want to touch gloves, am I ready to fight? All right, let, baby, let's get it. I like it. Both of these men are great competitors. 24 wins for Archuleta. As John said, 13 and 0 for Patchy Mix. One man will leave with that gold belt First round, around buddy, their you ready? waist. Buddy, you ready? Fight! Here we go! Tonight's Fight Clock brought to you by Geico Archuleta in the red gloves, the natural southpaw patchy mix in the blue gloves. He will switch his stance. It's normal for Archuleta to use a lot of movement. He uses his feet, moves himself in and out. That is one of the things that makes him difficult to time and difficult to hit. Not only that, but he switches his stance so much. And this is exactly what he didn't want to do, was overcommit on a strike and end up in this position like I talked about with the body block. That was actually a nice job of him getting his back to the fence from that position since Patchy got that double underhooks with that body lock. That's a bad position. He can be elevated and brought down. John, all the talking about we used to train together. Talk, One saying, yeah, I got the better of them. Juan admitting it, but guess what? We're going to see who's better now. And I'm so excited to see <laughs> what's going to happen. Do not grab. Talk is talk. It doesn't matter. You've you got, you got to make these things work in the cage. It doesn't matter what you can do in a training, man. I, I, I don't know how many times you know, I used to own my own gym. And guys would come in there and some people that would work out with a professional partner, oh, he's not that good. Really, you're not being punched in the face. There's a big difference. Well, we just saw that with Neiman Gracie. Like, his style of jiu-jitsu is different than, the, like, a competition style where he's able to get off. But most top black belts that just train strictly for competition style, you hit them one or two times, they become white belts really fast. <laughs> yep, it's true. There you go. That didn't happen with Neiman, by the way. Well, and what you, and what you just saw, that there's a lot going on right here. And the Apache has worked for this takedown. He's had the ability to get it with those double underhooks. He's got Juan to his butt, but he's not been in a position to do anything with it. And Juan has got himself back up. And Apache's now working to get him back down to the ground. There it is. Beautiful. Step over. Step over. Step over. Keep him hips up. Apache trying to extend that leg. Yes. Juan with a nice cross face there to get, make sure he's pushing him off. Body, body shots missed with the uppercut on the exit. But it was nice body shots on the exit. Yes. And you're taking a look at all of that work that Patchy did and really what, what did he achieve with it. That's the difference. He's got to make Juan pay in those positions. And Archuleta just connected with the right hand. Well, what Patchy needs to not do throughout this fight is put his head down and just wait for Juan to throw punches. He's waiting for Juan to get in within range so he could try to grab him. And he had his head straight down. That's not where you want to be with Juan Archuleta. We saw the knockout power and all the highlights rolling up to this. Beautiful work. Good job. That the walkout knockout in his career. Very good. Three minutes in to a potential 25-minute championship fight. Overextended right into a mistake, and Patchy's taking advantage of him. Now he's on the back. There we go. Got to keep that chin tucked. There's that figure four body lock around the body waist that I talked about. This is where he does most of his work. He gets to the back, or he gets to the guillot the arm and guillotine, and he just locks that figure four around. And guys have a hard time. And this also does not favor Juan because he can't roll to the right where he needs to to try to unlock that. You're exactly right. And one of the things that makes Patchy very dangerous is he 
doesn't just go for the neck. He will go for the arm from this position. He will go for things like leg locks, Suloev stretches. He's got a big arsenal when it comes to the submission game. Archuleta fighting it off so far. This is where he needs to be right here. I know he still has the figure four lock, but see how Juan has double wrist control and he took the arm and he over put it the to the head. offside. That's exactly what he needs to do, but he needs to unlock that figure four first. Well, at least now he's in a position where he can turn his body to the right, put that figure four with that foot to the ground, which will actually increase the space for him to turn with it. Also, too, Patchy thinks he's, it feels like he's in a good position. You guys are watching at home, but his neck being against the fence keeps him from being able to arch his, his hips into Juan's back if he was to able to get to lock the choke. That fight five and a half years ago, in which Archuleta was submitted, he was, in Joe Daddy's words, blowing him up. Joe Daddy counted the elbows. He said there were 36. And Juan said he just made a mistake, and that's all it took. He cannot make a mistake against Patchy Mix. What you guys need to pay attention to is how Patchy is switching his figure forward from side to side, and that comes from him having the long limbs to be able to do that. And that's just top, top judicial skill right there. Final 10 seconds of round one of our Phantomweight World Championship fight. In the mount. This one is all about Bellator gold. In the corner of Juan Archuleta, TJ Dillashaw said, you're, you're lunging, you're lunging, and you guys alluded to it. That's how Patchy Mix put him in a little bit of danger there. Josh alluded to that. I want to make sure that's clear. Oh. <laughs> it was good, though. TJ, TJ pointed it out. <laughs> a little nonverbal going on between John and Josh. But what's going to happen in this is Juan has made it very clear that he knows that in the first round, maybe even two, that Patchy will be there. Sure. He needs to avoid the submission and making big mistakes. I think his corner will just talk him through that. I think as the fight goes on, we're going to see Patchy start to slow down a little bit and, start, and not be able to use as much strength. And Juan talked about that, yeah. taking him into the deep waters where Patchy hasn't been before. We're not there yet, though. Please be careful of that inverted triangle. Round two. What he needs to do, Juan needs to open up that right elbow, and that'll help clear the unlocking of it. He's done it. There you go. So he'll do is he'll take one of his arms and reach back around his hips and try and spin in, in, in between his legs so he can take his back. But while doing that, he's got to be careful that Patchy doesn't roll underneath and try to attack a knee bar. Well, he could roll for it. Right now, he's not in a position he's going to be able to roll for that leg based upon where his head's at and where those legs are at. Patchy needs to figure out there comes a point where I need to get myself out of the position I'm in because it's not going to work for me. But right now, he's, he's into that reverse guard position where there are leg locks available. There's a lot of things that he can try to do. No, but what I'm talking about is when Juan goes to sit up and reach around, he'll stand a little bit, and that'll open up the legs a tiny bit. Yes, yes, yes. Come on, let's go. Patchy Mix, Jackson Wink MMA. They've had a lot of gold. And a lot of champions come out of Albuquerque, New Mexico. What you're watching Watch here is a chess test. match. Yes. I was going to say, we've got kinetic chess going on right now, Josh. So Juan's trying to avoid standing up because he doesn't want him to come underneath and try to attack the knee bar or some sort of leg lock that we've seen earlier tonight. But Tiki and, as I mentioned, TJ Dillashaw in the corner of Archuleta. Of course, Greg Jackson, Mike Winklejohn, the leader in Albuquerque, New Mexico, Brandon Gibson. Good transition. Great job by Patchy to move himself into taking Juan's back. Back to that figure four, John. Well, he's great with the figure four. He controls the body so well with the figure four. And he always takes that foot that he's locking it down with, and you'll see him bring it inside of the legs to hold on, outside of the leg. He is very long when we're talking about the inseam and his ability to wrap that leg around a guy that's only 135 pounds. Oh, he's got a lot of space. Mike Goldberg, Josh Thompson, Big John McCarthy, Jen Brown, Chael Sonnen. This is round two of our main event for the Bantamweight World Championship. Juan Archuleta 
and Patchy Mix. Patchy Mix, 13 and 0. Juan Archuleta, 24 and 2. Patchy Mix looking for another submission finish. Beautiful job with the switch of that figure four. Notice that the figure four is always with the foot up. Yeah, <laughs> good side, tough. right? That makes it very tough to get out of it. Patchy is great at switching that thing when he needs to to make sure that he has the ability to create the pressure to hold on to it. This is not where I want to see Juan, though, because right now Patchy can choke him from both sides. He needs to pick a side, like I continue to say, because then you only have to worry about defending one side. There you go, Juan. Now he's got to be careful. You gotta watch out for that triangle right off the bat. Juan needs to take away that left arm. Good knee. That was a great knee. Trying to break him down, which is what Juan Archuleta told us is his strategy. Well, Juan Archuleta has been going to the body even when this round started. Look at all the body shots yes. that he was landing. And he's continued to do that when he's had the, the ability to actually land a strike. He's going after that body, and there's a reason. He believes going into deep waters, he's going to be able to get Patchy tired and get him. There was that arm and guillotine he jumped to, and then he went right to his next transition. That's the problem with dealing with guys that are really good at jiu-jitsu is they have a sequence that they use, and they use it every single day against guys they train with every single day. And if it works on them, it pretty much will work on your opponent. Archuleta doing a nice job, and he's going to finish strong here in round two. Heavy ground and pound. A couple shots to the back of the head, Jeff. They're done. Just missed with that hammer fist. 15 submissions as an amateur, nine submissions as a professional. We're gonna head to round number three of our title fight. If I take that body and I put holes in that gas tank, when it comes to the fourth and fifth round, that's when you're gonna see me take him out. But it's two love patchy mix, John, right? In my mind, I've got patchy mix up, two love. Josh, I have a two love as well, but look at right now. Patchy looks like he's slowing down quite a bit. The push kick to the thigh, the, the punches, the combinations are coming out a little bit slower and labored. Beautiful. Patchy mix, 13 and 0. Nine wins by submission. Three times he's gone 15 minutes. Look at every time you're watching Juan Archuleta come in and land shots, he is at least landing a body shot. There he goes again, body shot, body shot. Those body shots are going to add up. That's like putting money in the bank. Archuleta, of course, doing his strength and conditioning with Sam Calavita. And again, you can see the strategy for Archuleta. I have to That's agree. I feel like he, Juan looks phenomenal at this weight class. He's handling, he's handling the reach, the range, the size of Patchy Mix. If you guys don't know, Patchy Mix is a very big 135 pounder. Round three of our championship fight. When we talk about you know fight IQ and getting a fighter to understand, hey, you don't have to win this thing right away. You don't have to win it the first round. You don't have to win it the second round. You have 25 minutes to win this fight. That's the difference that you're seeing right now in these two individuals. Juan Archuleta is looking to take this thing into deep waters. Patchy Mix is looking to end this fight at any moment that he can with a submission. And every moment that it goes by, they get sweatier, things get harder, your, your muscles get more tired, your grip gets looser, all those things happen. Juan Archuleta is ripping that body. And fights scheduled for 25 minutes, as I mentioned earlier. The three fights, all wins by submission for Patchy. Two in the first, one in the third. The fight with Patricio Pitbull was a big learning experience for him. And as we're looking at the striking stats here, you can see, I mean, you've got Juan Archuleta picking him apart. But John, nothing extremely hard has landed. I hope the body shots have landed. And those, and even though they don't sound hard, they are hard and they do hurt. And they do start paying dividends in the later rounds. They just affect your breathing pattern. You, know, you get hit to the body, and so then you go to take that breath, and it's not quite the same. Your diaphragm's not working the same. You don't get that full breath of air. Yeah, there we go. We that one hurt. But I talked about my and my keys to victory, and part of it was that Juan Archuleta needs to stay on his bike, and that's exactly what he's doing now. He's on his bike, picking and choosing his shots, not giving Patchy Mix a target to shoot on. You're pushing it back. 
Archuleta said of that fight against Patricio Pitbull that he didn't find his groove until the third round and that in the end he beat himself mentally. Dude, right now he's finding his groove in the third again. Not a lot of guys find their groove against Patricio Pitbull. Just, it's fair. Let's just be honest. Not a lot of guys go 25 minutes no, that's with Patricio true. Pitbull either. But Juan's finding his mark, whether it's to the body or to the head against Patchy Mix. And Patchy's kind of just standing in the range, but not he hasn't looked like he's committed to a takedown just yet. 90 seconds remaining in round three. Much different looking round than the first two, to say the least. But we've seen that Juan can do this for five rounds. One he can strike and move. And he'll mix in the wrestling as well, which will make Patchy even more tired because he'll be able to ankle pick like John was pointing out in his telestrate. That's your sketch. <laughs> nice body shot there in a row. He's throwing those body shots from the canvas. Yeah, and see, and, and a big part of what you're seeing right now, a lot of people are seeing Patsy Mix being aggressive, coming with pressure, and they're like, "Well, he's the one that's coming forward." Juan Archuleta is the one that's landing the better shots in this round. It does not matter who is going forward; it matters who is landing the cleaner shots. And that, right now in this round, it's Juan Archuleta. Oh, big right hand! Nice left hand over the top. Outstanding striking here in round three for the Spaniard. See a little bit of that frustration on Patchy Mix's yes, face. Do. We have got ourselves a fight. And that is never good, John. Nope. 10 seconds. We will head to the championship round. Fourth round, buddy, you ready? Buddy, you ready? Fight! Championship rounds! This is a first for Patchy Mix. He has never been in a round number four. Archuleta has gone 25 minutes three times in his career. He's two and one. That one was Patricio. He also has a fourth round finish by knockout on his ledger. And he got round three. So it's now 2-1, Patchy. At least on our unofficial. Correct. From the big brain to Big John. What I'm, I'm getting a little, I'm a little concerned about is that Patchy's not even trying to get the takedown. So he's, get, he's, he's not in range. He's got to use that push kick to make Juan have something to get past. Because right now Juan's just picking him apart, stepping in, in and out whenever he would like. But there's no takedown attempts right now. I feel like Patchy's slow down and trying to get those takedown attempts. Well, as we, as we talked about in those keys to victory, when you brought up one of my things was patience, patience, patience. Because when you're a young fighter and everything you've done in all your fights has, has worked, it's been successful, how are you going to deal with your opponent when everything you're doing is not successful? You've got to remain still patient and take your time and don't get frustrated. And I think we're seeing a little bit of frustration sometimes out of patchy mix. And Juan Archuleta said, and I quote, looking for him to slow down in the fourth and the fifth, and he connects with a jab. What Juan did there a second ago was he hit him with the jab, and then he drugged the right hook across the body of Patchy and hit him to the body. Very nicely done. It's the level changes in his stand-up that I believe is giving Patchy some problems. Patchy's very tall for a bantamweight, and sometimes when you have a guy, you're used to punch it down a little bit, but when a guy's really bending down at the waist and digging shots, it's not an easy thing to count. I want to see more of that. If you're going to stay on your feet, let let one come to you well, and then push kick him because you know if one over commits like he did in the first round the takedown becomes a little easier to get and the and the big part is if you want this fight to go to the ground so utilize those kicks let him try to catch the kick let him go for the takedown let's let's get to the ground like he is right now this is where you want to be I gotta tell you, I, I'm, I didn't like that. Only the fact that I was waiting for one of you guys to say it. I was waiting for one of you guys to say it. Watch out. the head. Watch the head. Time. Time. Came under the arm. No, no, no. Time. Came under the arm. Time. Right here. Right here. Let's watch it on the replay. How are we doing here? Yeah. So that blocked it. He blocked it. Yeah. It's because I blocked it. Right here. No coaching. No coaching. You're good. Yeah. 
Oh, that would have, even that, if it wasn't blocked, right it would have been to the First chest, up. right, John? That is a kick. Okay, it is legal. All right. It's a legal it's kick. To me. He can kick him to the legal. body. Like he can kick illegal. him to the you arm. That is a legal kick. Patchy Mix got a break that he did not deserve off of that. But was it his fault? No, okay. not at all. Art Gillette right away said, no, it was the body. It was the body. It was. The fight continues. And Juan Archuleta continues to pick Patchy Mix apart. It is very tough to be in there and see things at real speed and catch everything because your eyes have to be on that spot. But a fighter who is grounded is allowed to be kicked to the body or kneed to the body by his opponent. I like what Patchy's doing right now. He threw a couple head kicks or up by the head a little bit and it's actually changed a little bit of what Juan was doing. So again, round four, like the last round, a Juan Archuleta-type round after Patchy looked for an early finish in the first 10 minutes and this is one of, of this things, fight. When you're Patchy Mix, sometimes you get the feeling like you're winning the round because I'm going forward, I'm being the aggressor. That is not getting you this round. It's who's landing the cleaner blows because if the judges can see who is landing cleaner blows, they don't go to aggressiveness and they don't go to cage control. Damage. Number one. Patchy's also very young, John, and I think yeah. a little bit of that is also this is going to be a learning experience for him. I, he's still in this fight. There's no doubt oh, about no it. No doubt about it. He, he just got, I think he's, you can tell the frustration because he's talking to him. He's raising his arm. He's changing things up. He's not staying clean with everything he's doing. I didn't doing. see it. Go. I didn't see it. And championship experience is certainly on the side of Juan Archuleta. But now he's chasing after him aimlessly, like just... This is what he needs to do, but he needs to do it a little bit more composed. See how he's chasing him and not cutting the, the cage off. There's a difference between cutting the cage and chasing your opponent. And you want to make it to where you're forcing your opponent where you're going to go. Archuleta's footwork is awesome tonight. Fun to watch. But when you train with guys like Cub Swanson, TJ Dillashaw, Lance Palmer, Sayanawad, move a lot. You know? He credits Cub for a lot of his early success and learning about the fight game in and out of the cage. Oh, great combination. Here, right here. I didn't see it. I didn't see it. Right Take your time right here. I didn't see it. Juan Archuleta. Patchy mix. Five minutes remain. The winner becomes the Bellator Bantamweight World Champion. One thing you really have to be impressed with, Josh, that we talked about, how was Patchy Mix going to do if this fight got into deep waters, into that fifth round? And you can see that his conditioning is on point because he's taken a lot of body shots, he's put out a lot of energy, and he is still coming. On that unofficial scorecard, if this fight does go the distance, the winner of this round will walk away with the goal. You can tell those body shots hurt because Patrick took his half step back. Yep. Kind of gave him a smirk like those, those didn't hurt, which meant they hurt. Oh, he's continuing to pour it on. Too. You can see he's starting to suck air. You see he's trying to grab air because he cannot get his body to breathe in normal fashion. That makes his takedown attempt not as effective. Body shots are horrible. Oh my goodness, it's almost, John, like his precision is precise. Almost. Did you just say that? Well, I did, but I was kidding that time. I know. John, we, we talked. Look at the numbers. Very impressive oh. by Juan Archuleta, and he's just picking him apart right now on the body. But you talked about what was impressive by Patchy, him getting into the fifth round, still looking good, still, the conditioning's still there, taking all these body shots. What I'm most impressed with, though, is by Juan Archuleta. Of course. He can do his game plan, though. Yes. Not letting the trash talk get to him, not letting all the hype and all these other things get to him. He has stayed on course the whole time. He had a plan. He stuck with a plan. Look at where it's got him so far. He's a four-division champion no. looking for time? the biggest I'm belt yep. I'm good, I'm good. of his good? professional yep. career. Right. Watch your blows. He has been in the pressure cooker, if you will, of title fights many times. A first time to the fifth, a first time to the fourth for Patchy Mix. Archuleta continues 
to strike dynamically. Big right, like little uppercut hook that he landed coming out of that turn. What Juan's doing really Beautiful well here left is hook to the body. stepping his foot on the outside of Patchy's lead leg and hit ripping that body, going to the inside on the right side on the right hook and going to the outside on the left hook. Busting him up inside. Again. So now he knows Patchy's going to cover up with his elbows. Now he's coming up top to the head. He's just beautifully picking this fight apart right now. Has the midway point of the fifth and final round. Straight hand by Patchy. Of this bantamweight title fight. Archuleta in the red. Patchy Mix in the blue. John has it tied at two. So does Josh. With just over two remaining. This is still anyone's fight. I know Juan's winning the first half of this fight, but if Patchy does a couple nice shots, able to do anything, there you go right there. Nice head kick. Patchy coming forward, but he's got to throw. Patchy needs to get a takedown here that would really help him in solidifying this round if he could get on top. Ears, fighter, ear. Time's ticking, John. Time is ticking, but if you're one Archuleta, you can look and say, well, right now what I'm doing is I'm working towards getting a little bit of a breather so I go into this last minute and a half and just put it all out. Punch back of the head. Keep on working, guys. So, you, know, you can look at you can say, well, Patchy's throwing punches. Those are not punches. That's more irritation than anything. We're looking for damage. Well, technically, they are punches, but I get what you're saying. No, they're technically. You're not grab the cage. Just grab the cage. Grab that the kept cage. him up. But Patchy needs a little sense of urgency with one minute left. He needs to at least threaten some sort of submission here to start thinking that maybe that he gets close. Start skewing the judges towards the end of the round. Archuleta has not slowed down at all. Well, I would agree one thing with Josh right here is Juan Archuleta has now got the double underhooks. Do something with it or get yourself out and go back to what was making you successful. Final minute of the fight. Beautiful. Juan's got to make sure he keeps his head up high because you know we saw earlier Apache jumped on that army guillotine right away. Nice elbow, very nice elbow on the exit. Final 30 seconds. Who will be the new champion? Spin and a miss. I need more. 15 seconds. A little clash of heads. Nice knee up the middle, Juan ripping the body. They go the distance! Juan Archuleta and Patchy Mix. It's early because Patchy Mix was looking for yet another finish. Well, this is where he was surviving because Patchy was getting that back. And he was doing good work. He was getting that body triangle. He was controlling a lot of the action, winning the first couple of rounds the way we looked at it. But it was the game plan of Archuleta and these body shots that he was ripping. Coming in, nice shot up high, going to the body, always making him pay to the body. That was the difference in the fight. Ladies and gentlemen, having gone a full five rounds, we go now to your three judges at cage side. Your first judge, David Torelli, scores the fight 49 to 46. While judges Brian Miner and Doug Crosby both see the fight the same, 48 to 47. All have it for the winner by unanimous decision. And now the new Bellator Bantamweight World Champion, Juan the Spaniard. Archuleta! Juan Archuleta is the Bellator Bantamweight World Champion. Bellator MMA Live on Showtime from Mohegan Sun Arena. The time has come for the main event of the evening. Five five-minute rounds for the Bellator Bantamweight World Championship, sanctioned by the Mohegan Tribe Department of Athletic Regulation Chairman James Gessner, President of Sports and Entertainment Tom Cantone, Chief of the Mohegan Tribe Lynn Malerba, and Supervising at Cage Side Director Mike Mazzulli. And now, first, we introduce the Blue Corner at five foot six, weighing in 134 and three quarter pounds. 
the number one ranked contender as a professional, enters with 20 wins, five losses from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, presenting the challenger, SP Sergio Pettis. Let's go. Let's go, baby. And across the cage, the champion fights out of the red corner at five foot seven, Woo! weighing in 135 pounds even in his first title defense. He stands tonight with 25 professional victories, just two defeats, fighting out of Hesperia, California, introducing the defending Bellator Bantamweight World Champion, Juan the Spaniard Archuleta. In charge, your referee, Kevin McDonald. Fight to the center, please. Gentlemen, this is five rounds under the unified rules for the belt. Want a good, clean fight? If you'd like, touch gloves now. Best of luck to you. Oh, referee Kevin McDonald with final instructions. We are set for a possible five rounds for that, the Bellator Bantamweight Championship. Ready to fight? Ready to fight? Let's go. The belt, round one, the champion Archuleta in the red gloves, the challenger Pettis in the blue gloves. And already, Archuleta on the move. That is his style that is not gonna change. He, you're gonna see big movements. He moves back and forth, but it's when he takes those steps inside, he'll actually change stance from orthodox to south paw and back as he comes forward. Archuleta fighting out of the training lab, HB Ultimate and Gracie Baja, while Pettis represents Rufus Sport. Exchange. Of course, Pettis facing a murderer's row at 125 pounds in UFC, John, but now here at 135 pounds, undefeated in Bellator, riding a three-fight win streak. Well, he fought the best of the best there was at 125, but it got to a point where Sergio was just too big for the 125-pound weight class, did not want to fight at that. He wanted to move up to band weight, and he was able to do that when he came over to Bellator, and he's happy at this weight class. Kick by Pettis. They're going to shave the whiskers of the champion. Good level change by Archuleta. Looks for the takedown immediately. Pettis attacking the neck. Attacking that neck. You see that right now, Juan going towards that single leg, to, almost towards a high crotch. Just needs to pull his head out for this to be able to work. And you're seeing Pettis maintaining that position on his head, putting weight down and keeping him heavy. Two of Pettis's four submission wins have come via guillotine choke, but right now just trying to thwart the takedown attempt by Juan Archuleta. Yeah, there's definitely no guillotine attempt right now. He's just looking at defending this takedown. Archuleta needs to switch it up, go from the single into that high crotch pull, then shoot to the double. The more that he can transition and chain those techniques together, the more effective one of them will be. Archuleta began wrestling at the age of three, as we showed you tonight, comes from a family of wrestlers. Nice elbows by Sergio Pettis in defense of that takedown. You see him Juan try to step to his left to try to stop that attack. And again, Archuleta looking for the takedown, and Pettis able to escape circle and a reset. Two minutes left here in the opening round. That right there makes Sergio Pettis feel pretty good about himself, because he's like, okay, you tried, you know, got in tight, got in deep, and I was able to defend it off. That's a good feeling for Sergio Pettis. Counter right hand by the challenger Pettis. A minute 45 left here in the opening round as the champion Archuleta looking to make use of every single inch of real estate in that Bellator MMA cage. Off 
Duke Rufus calling for an up a jab from Sergio Pettis. Oh, nice, nice counter right hand by Pettis. Beautiful counter right hand. Archuleta did a nice job going to the body, but as he exited, that left hand was down, and Sergio was able to counter with a solid right hand. Lead left by the champion, Archuleta. There's a left, nice, lead left nice, by nice Pettis, check, and a right hand down the middle by the challenger. Under a minute left here in the opening round. This is what we were talking about, that sharp shooting style. He's very tight. Right hand lands for Pettis. So Pettis with a good striking effort here in the uh, first round. 45 seconds left. Archuleta continuing to go to the body. That's That paid dividends for him against Patchy Mix. We'll see if that happens in this fight against Pettis. Thus far here in the first round, that jab has definitely paid dividends for Sergio Pettis, opening up opportunities to throw the combination. And there's Archuleta attacking the lead leg inside and outside. Nice elbow and a swing back by Sergio Pettis. That landed. And Archuleta was looking to get his hooks and looks to get the takedown. Does so, but time runs out. Wow. Beautiful <laughs> reversal by Pettis. And round two. The bell and round uh, number two. Scheduled for five for the Bellator Bantamweight belt. My scorecard right now, looking at that first round, think of all the shots that Pettis was able to put. When you saw Arch Atlanta trying to take him down, the elbows to the head and then the clean strikes that he was able to land at times, I give Sergio Pettis that first round 10 down. Archuleta getting to increase his offensive output using angles to Close the distance before launching his attack. That's a nice feint on that takedown attempt right there. That's going to get Sergio's hands moving up and down. That's when you're going to see Juan taking advantage of him reacting to that feint. I do like the fact of what I'm seeing from Pettis as far as the way that he's actually dealing with the movement. There's Archuleta. the takedown by Archuleta. Continue, John. That's a good takedown, but you, what you were seeing is Pettis is taking as few a steps as possible. He's just basically pivoting his body, pivoting his feet, and he was able to just be very calm with all that movement that Juan Archuleta is putting out. But it was a nice takedown by Juan Archuleta now as Sergio's trying to work his way to get towards that cage so he can get back to his feet. And Pettis is back to his feet, but the champion Archuleta has his back. Attacking the leg. Pettis turns in and disengages. And that's a normal thing for Archuleta to actually disengage and try to land a strike on that exit. Mm -hmm. Two minutes gone here in the second. Archuleta from the, well, was Southpaw, now back to Orthodox. Jab, pops his head back. You're really starting to see that Sergio is really getting confident in his counter strikes. He's waiting for Juan to make that attack, and then he's countering with beautiful strikes, left and right hand, especially a big right hand, and now going, actually bringing kicks into the equation. Midway point of the second round. Rufus encouraging Pettis not to be backed up by the champion Archuleta, and Pettis is holding his ground. Now, did you see how Pettis stepped to the outside of Archuleta, which stopped that progression of him being able to move to his right? And then Archuleta automatically is going back to the left. Got it's, a right hand by Pettis. Pettis is the guy that's, he's the one really controlling this movement right now. There's no doubt that Pettis watched what Patricio Pitbull did in his fight with Juan Archuleta and how he stopped a lot of the movement of Juan. And he's taking that same page and how he's doing the, 
what he's doing with his hands, what he's doing with his footwork. Sharp jabs by Pettis throughout this fight. Minute and a half remaining in the second. Sweeping left hook got the champion. There's a jab and a nice right hand to the body by Archuleta. Counter right hand. Another counter right hand by Sergio Pettis and blood now on the face of Archuleta under a minute remaining in the second round. Yeah. Right now, Pettis is being very accurate with those counters. He's getting just a little bit ahead movement, getting out of the way of what Juan Archuleta is throwing, and then giving that nice counter. One, two by Archuleta that landed, then went to the body, but Pettis again quick to pull the trigger on the counter, timing it well. 30 seconds left here in the second round. Archuleta back, self up, orthodox. Pettis doing the same thing and doing a great job of avoiding the champion's offensive rush. Beautiful hook there by Archuleta. Nice hook. That right hand of Sergio Pettis is making a difference in this fight right now. And Archuleta looks for the takedown of the belt. Now three. This is round number three, scheduled for five for the Bellator Bantamweight Championship. Archuleta defending the title for the first time against the challenger Pettis, who's in the blue gloves. You see Archuleta, the, the patterns that you've seen out of the likes of TJ Dillashaw. Again, another person who has very deft footwork, dominant grooves. Nice right hand by both guys. Archuleta landed the right hand, Sergio landed the right hand counter. It takes a very disciplined fighter to be able to deal with that type of footwork and movement from Archuleta. It's because Sergio Pettis has been doing this for so long and is so comfortable in that stand up range that he's able to deal with this type of movement. Yeah, Pettis turned pro three weeks after he turned 18. <laughs> he's 27 now. Well, at least he waited until he was an adult. <laughs> a minute gone here in the third. Archuleta going back and forth from Southpaw to Orthodox. Pettis missed with that right hand. Flashes the jab. There's a good combination that landed for Archuleta. And then the counter right from Pettis. That is exactly right. Archuleta did land, but the best shot out of that entire grouping was the right hand by Pettis. Nice jab by Pettis. Oh, the good jab by Archuleta. So they're beginning to tag each other. Another sharp jab by Archuleta. And there's a left hook and a right hand splitting the guard for Pettis. High level, high stakes. Nice foot kick by Pettis coming up. Both guys are really starting to just... That Terrific. Pace, that pace is really starting to up. Increase in pace and increase in offense and an increase in the amount of strikes that are connecting the champion moving again orthodox to southpaw trying to befuddle the challenger pettis who appears to be very calm cool and collected and very poised it only takes one shot from either of these guys both of them are landing they're just not landing with that perfect thing but look at those punch stats 25 of 145 for archuleta 30 of 108 for pettis And Archuleta looking for the takedown, goes behind Pettis. Pettis looking to break the grip. 
He's got those hands apart. Nice job of getting himself centered back up. He's got an underhook there, but he's just pressing on the hip. Nice relaxed position. Go grab the fence. Head position, head position. Archuleta just, at this moment, this is the time you just take a little bit of a breath, use this position to say, all right, I'm just going to get my win. Let's see if I can get the takedown. If I can't, I'm not going to work too hard at it. And I want to always exit with a strike. Ben is able to exit to his right and then gets popped in the face <laughs> by that Archuleta jab. Good body kick by Pettis as Archuleta was moving in. It's been a better round for Archuleta. He's landed some cleaner shots in this round than he has in the prior one. Venice from South Pod delivers the right jab. Archuleta again coming in at angles, zigzagging and striking. Pettis, lead left hook to the body by Archuleta, but again eats the jab upstairs from the challenger. It's those angle changes when he's coming in that lateral direction that makes it very difficult for you to stop those shots that he's throwing. Sergio's doing a very good job of reading that, centering himself back up, staying just out of range of times. We are through uh, three rounds in this Bellator Hanaway <laughs> Championship match. Stop. Clean break. Well, it looked good. Yeah, it wasn't exactly the Showtime kick, but the Showtime spin, maybe. Juan Archuleta, the seventh person to hold the Bellator Bantamweight Championship. The only two-time champion at 135 pounds was Eduardo Dantas. The title's only been successfully defended four times, three times by Dantas as things pick up here early in the fourth. That was a nice clean right hand that Sergio Pettis landed when Juan Archuleta came in. Right now I have this fight two to one right now with Pettis in the lead. It could, that third round was very close. I can see where judges could go either way, but I gave it to Archuleta for landing the cleaner shots throughout the round. I didn't see Pettis having as many counters as he had in the first and second. Nice clean left hand by Sergio Pettis there. Again, Archuleta, body lock, employed trim takedown, and Pettis immediately pops back up to his feet. Well, a minute gone here in the fourth. That was a nice job by Juan Archuleta to get in on that body lock, get that takedown, and a beautiful job by Sergio Pettis to pop right back up to his feet. That is frustrating if you're Juan Archuleta. Jab by Pettis. Archuleta not moving oh. that much and gets tagged that with that counter right hand by Sergio Pettis. That was two right hands that landed. Looks for the takedown. Archuleta able to escape his grasp. But that's just a good movement by Pettis because it makes Archuleta actually have to deal with, oh, he'll actually try to take me down. Beautiful combination. Lands for the challenger, follows it up with another sharp jab. See, right now in this round, Juan Archuleta has become a much more linear fighter. You see how he's coming straight in, right. straight out, instead of creating those angles. Not a lot of movement in terms of oh. the angles. And again, he's paying for it yes, by staying in that pocket. No doubt about it, Moore. You're so right. That right hand just landed with clean power again. Pettis able to counter sharply. 
And not expanding nowhere near the energy that Archuleta is in terms of Archuleta's movement. Oh, and again, that counter right, John, is there all night. Beautiful left jab by Pettis. Again, Pettis is just being the sniper. He is waiting, he's looking for that movement, and as that movement's occurring, he's seeing the opening and tagging it, just like he just did again. Archuleta coming forward, but not having the success that Sergio Pettis is, and Pettis, there's a knee to the body, and then the exit. A minute and a half left in the fourth. Archuleta goes to the body with the jab, then goes upstairs. Now from Southpaw Stance, it's a body kick back to Orthodox. Goes Archuleta, and another stiff jab from Pettis. Pettis is just landing the cleaner shots and heavier shots. Yes. One minute, one minute, one minute. <laughs> Final 60 seconds of the penultimate round of the Bellator 258 main event to the best 135 pounders battling for Bellator gold. One of the things that we've seen multiple times with Juan Archuleta, he has the power to end this fight with one shot. The problem is you've got to be able to land that perfect shot. 11 of Archuleta's 25 victories have come via form of knockout. For Pettis, he has three knockouts on his resume, but definitely bringing the counterattack to the champion. 20 seconds left, and again, that right cross by Pettis. Well, we've seen Pettis has power. You saw the shot that he knocked Alfred yes. Kachaki and down with it in order to submit him. That was big time power, but he's not, he's not even going for the big power here. He is just saying, I'm gonna keep touching you, and they're eventually just gonna start to add up, and it's working. Champion Juan Archuleta needs to finish Sergio Pettis if he wants to hold on to that belt. Gentlemen, Dwayne Ludwig uh, lowering the verbal boom <laughs> on the champion as we begin the fifth and final round. The title up for grabs here. And Archuleta, an aggressive start to the final round. My scorecard right now, like I said, I have Archuleta down. I have only one round, and it's possible that the judges could even have looked and given that one to Pettis, so he needs to get a finish, in my opinion, if he wants to hold on to that belt. Sergio Pettis, economical and efficient. Archuleta gets staggered momentarily again with that sharp jab from Sergio Pettis. Archuleta changes levels, looks for the takedown, drives Pettis into the fence. Nice job by Sergio Pettis. Get himself, turn in, gets the underhook, gets away from Archuleta. Now in the you know, fifth round, sweaty, slippery, not easy to hold on to your opponent. Double jab from the challenger, Sergio Pettis. And it gone here in the final frame. Joe Pettis taking small steps forward before Archuleta coming for it, but doesn't throw. There's another exchange, and again, it ends with the counter from Pettis. Beautiful counter left hook right there by Pettis, landed clean. Archuleta trying to get Pettis to bite. Yes, he was. Gave that little knee tap look. Trying to bring the overhand right. Pettis was already back out. Said, no, I've seen it before. You're not going to catch me with that. Pettis switches to orthodox. to the inside. Pettis holding his ground. Two and a half minutes left in this championship fight. Pettis, Pettis knows that when Archuleta makes that move inside, he's kind of dropping his head, and that's what he's targeting. You see him, he just takes a look, brings the hook, brings the uppercut, brings the straight right. 
We are down to the final two minutes of this Bellator Bantamweight Championship fight, and it's Archuleta lifting Pettis up and then bringing him back down to the ground into side control, John. Uh, he's in side control, but he's got to get out of this yes. inverted triangle position that he's kind of stuck with. I can't see if he's got his arm inside there or not right now. From where I'm at, it's really, yeah, the arm is there, but... Well, a position that the champion definitely needs to maximize. A minute and a half left in the fight. It only takes one, but Juan Archuleta has got, he, right now he's in that position of, I want to control, I want to keep pressure, but I have to actually gain space so I can do something with this position. He's unable to right now. There's one minute, get up, one minute, get up. Get up. Watch this one. Keep those knees going. There's a one minute. I'd like to know how someone needs someone to the spine when their spine is on the mat. <laughs> I'm under a minute left in the fight. Left doubles. Hold it hard. Left doubles. Left doubles. There it is. Archuleta really needs to go for something here. It needs to open up. Start to bring down heavy elbows, some hammer fists, something. To try to get Sergio Pettis in trouble. Thirty seconds left in the fight. Archuleta has Pettis' back, has one hook in. Pettis breaking the grip. Pettis is in good position. He's controlling the wrist on the one side. Turns back in and hammer fists the thigh of the champion Archuleta. And it will be up to the three judges at cage side to determine who walks out of the fight sphere. Bellator, Bantamweight champion. Very impressive. Take a look at some of the action from that fifth and final round. Nice left hook landing. You see how solid that landed on Juan Archuleta. Juan Archuleta picking. Sergio, you made that mistake in turning. Wow. Great. That's what we're looking for when you want to say, did the takedown count? That takedown yeah. counts, yes. That's called amplitude, elevation, and impact. Ladies and gentlemen, having gone five full rounds in this title fight, we go now to your three judges. Your first judge at cage side, Jacob Montalvo, scores the fight 50 to 45, while judges Brian Miner and Dave Peabody both see it exactly the same. 49 to 46. I'll have it for the winner by unanimous decision. And now the new Bellator Bantamweight World Let's Champion, go. SP Sergio Pettis.